Edward's Inns will have a uh, ten minute break because it's a long morning at around 11.15 or totally convenient. My lady, my lord, when we adjourned yesterday, I was addressing why it can't be said that in these cases there was any unfairly retrospective deprivation of a right, <coughs> a vested or accrued right, under regulations 185 and 188. I'm going to develop that now. First, the credit under those regulations for amounts which should have been deducted by the employer or accounted for by the employer but were not does not alter the amount of tax payable under a self-assessment or a self-assessment as amended by a closure notice or payable under a discovery assessment but only at the subsequent Whitney stage 3 collection stage I'm obviously going to need to come back to develop that much more fully under the jurisdiction argument, but I wanted to note it for now because it's the logical first step in the rest of what I'm going to say. But um, I, I will be developing it much more fully when we look at the jurisdiction issue. Second, the credit is only ever a contingent one in the sense that it will be disapplied whenever a direction is made by an officer under any of regulations 72 sub 5, 72 capital F sub 1, or 81 sub 4, including where an employer has not deducted the tax, but has taken reasonable care to comply with the regulations, <coughs> that's condition A in regulation 72, or whenever an employer has not accounted for the tax on the notional payments, <coughs> that's condition B in regulation 81. So condition B in regulation 81 is not hedged around with what the employer did or didn't uh, uh, um, do in terms of acting in good faith or taking reasonable care. So the second point, just to summarize, the credit is only ever a contingent one. Third, directions made under any of the regulations I've just mentioned can perfectly lawfully be made a long time after the relevant payments of PAYE income are made whether that be actual payments or notional payments. And that is so for several reasons. One, there are no specific time limits for the making of directions in any of regulations 72, 72F or 81. Two, the disapplication of the Reg 1855 and 1883 credit by any of these directions will only take effect, as I said before, in relation to the employee's obligation to pay the relevant amount to the revenue, i.e. Whitney Stage 3. And that will take effect, as I'll show you in a moment, 30 days after a Section 28A closure notice issued at the end of an inquiry, or 30 days after a Section 29 discovery assessment is issued, <coughs> subject, of course, to the further postponement of the obligation to pay if there's an appeal under the postponement provisions. And that is the effect of sections 59b sub 5 and 6 of the TMA. If we could just turn that up, please. Legislation bundle tab 1, page 98.
and I start with 59 capital B subsection 6, which is or includes discovery assessments. Any amount of income tax or capital gains tax which is payable by virtue of an assessment made otherwise than under section 9, so that will include a section 29 discovery assessment, shall, unless otherwise provided, be payable on the day following the end of the period of 30 days, beginning with the day on which the notice of assessment is given. So the payment obligation kicks in 30 days after the end of the discovery assessment process. 30 days being the period within which one can put in a notice of appeal. Precisely so, my lord. That dovetails with that. Precisely so. And then in five, this is uh, um, closure notices or covers closure notices, an amount of tax which is payable as a result of the amendment of a self assessment under dot 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 section 28A, that's closure notices for individual returns. I'm so sorry, Mr. Grodzinski. I've, I've left my legislation bundle. Ah. Uh, in my Would it help room. if I just stopped for a few? Yes. Minutes? Could you just give me one moment? Of course. Can, while can, I, while can you, you call Julie Wood and ask her to bring my legislation bundle. Um, can I take the opportunity of handing up um, the fascinating paragraph five of Schedule Three ZA of the TMA, which is referred to in the bit that I'm just going to take you to. Um, well, <clears throat> One of these days we'll manage, I hope, to get rid of these. <laughs> Schedule <laughs> 3 ZA. Numbers, <laughs> which make it such a misery to try and find one's way around the TMA. It model. does. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I think we only need the first of the three versions. You can hand it up three. You can probably discard versions two and three. Just look at version one. <clears throat> so can I, for my lady's assistance, just read out um, so I, you know where I'm going when you get your legislation bundle back. Section 59, capital B, subsection 5A, says, and I'm going to put in the dot, dot, dots, an amount of tax which is payable as a result of an amendment of a self-assessment under, oh, great. Yes, thank you, very good. So it, it, tab one, page 98. We're now in section 59B, I'm with you. Subsection five, an amount of tax which is payable as a result of the amendment, dot, 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 of a self-assessment under A, dot, 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 28A. That's a closure notice of an individual return. And then skipping down to the end of subsection five, is payable on or before the day specified by the relevant provision of Schedule 3 ZA. And in a closure notice case, it's paragraph five of Schedule 3 ZA. And again, as you'll see from the bit I've handed up, that's 30 days. <coughs> So my point is, insofar as a credit arises, it only first arises, if at all, 30 days after the end of the assessment process, subject, of course, to a further postponement of the obligation to pay tax under the postponement provisions relating to appeals. So it is not a vested right that accrues or crystallizes at the time the PAYE income is earned. Well, this is a matter of real practice because initial payments of PAYE when an employee starts, very often there'll be no tax deduction for it. <coughs> <coughs> that may be right, my, Until my lord. A 
for personal experience. <laughs> you get your tax code. You, you get it until you've got your tax code. You don't deduct any tax. Yeah. Well, I only got my first tax code relatively recently, and I would respectfully concur with. <laughs> <laughs> Um, three, and I'm now conscious I'm telling my grandparents to, um, I never understand the suck eggs um, <laughs> phrase, but that's what I'm about to do. Aren't we on to four? Yes. I think so. Or are we on a third? No, I think we're on, the, we're on the, no, we are under item, w w I'm explaining under my third reason. Okay, sorry, so three what? little seals, if we were. Yes. Yeah. As to the issuing of a closure notice, or the making of a discovery assessment, after which time the payment obligation first arises under Section 59B TMA. As my lords and lady know, the ordinary time limits on the revenue contained in the TMA will operate. So for an amendment to a, a um, well, start, in a closure notice case, HMRC have, broadly speaking, 12 months to open the inquiry under Section 9 TMA. Once they've opened an inquiry, um, there, are, there is no time limit by when they have to close it, subject, of course, to the taxpayer's right to make an application for a closure notice direction from the tribunal under Section 28 TMA. So that's the opening and closing of the uh, um, inquiry. If no in-time Section 9A TMA inquiry has been opened in the first place and the revenue instead want to make a Section 9 discovery assessment, then the ordinary time limits, typically four or six years, will apply under sections 34 and 36 TMA. So that's three A, B, and C. And then four, my fourth point, is that it is open to the revenue to make any of these directions under regulation 72 or 81 or 72 F, um, even after they have made their discovery assessment. That is the clear effect of regulation 188 sub 5. If we could just look at it, I'm going to have to come back to it again in some detail later on today. But just to show it to you, it's legislation bundle 326. <clears throat> Top of page 326. If a direction is made after the making of the assessment, that's the discovery assessment, and then certain things happen. I'm going to have to unpack this regulation or this subparagraph quite carefully later on. I'm just pausing now to observe that you can make a direction even after you have made a discovery assessment. I'll explain how that works later. Takes a number of readings, but when you read it enough times, it does become clear. Um, but the point I want to emphasize now is that the disapplication of the credit by any of the directions made under these regulations also operate retrospectively in the sense that. They disapply the credit after, sometimes years after, the time when the <coughs> earnings, the PAYE income, was paid to the employee and the original obligation to deduct or account may have arisen. So the 7A power, the 6847A power, which also has the effect of removing the contingent credit under regs 185 and 188, <coughs> and which is subject to precisely the same TMA time limits concerning the individual employee, in our respectful submission, and contrary to what the upper tribunal appear to have understood, operates no more retrospectively than the powers to disapply the credit in regulations 72, 72F, and 81. 
That's my first answer to the retrospectivity argument. I, um, so I've dealt with the presumption against retrospectivity and what it really is about. I've shown the court why there is no offensive retrospectivity. Uh, and I then need to turn to Mr. Mullen's reliance on the statutory language of 7a, which he says is prospectively operating only. And the question is whether, construed properly, the 7A power must be limited to a prospective only exercise in a way that would be entirely different from the direction powers that I've just shown you, which can operate years after the event. And in our submission, to construe the 7A power in that limited way would be entirely inconsistent with the policy of the regulations <coughs> and inconsistent with the general way in which the revenue exercise their assessment and related management powers, where they will typically, as the court will appreciate, only become aware of the facts well after the time of the payments to the employee, <coughs> either when they've opened an inquiry or where they've made a discovery for Section 29 purposes. And there is nothing in the language of 7AB which points to that restricted meaning. If we just turn back to um, 6847A, legislation bundle, at least the one I'm using, page 230. <clears throat> the language in 7AB is all expressed in the present tense. It is neither expressly prospective nor expressly retrospective. So, at the time the officer is considering whether to exercise the 7AB power, in my respectful submission, he or she has to ask themselves, taking into account all the circumstances now known to me, am I satisfied that it is appropriate to expect the employer, am I satisfied that it is appropriate to expect the employer, or in this case, the end user qua deemed employer, to comply with the regulations by accounting for the employee's income tax which ex hypothesi the end user has not so far complied with? That's the question that the officer has to ask himself <coughs> in the present tense. And in that context, just to address something Mr. Mullen said, it is wrong for him to assert that the accounting obligation under Regulation 62 has ceased to exist. That's the 62.5 accounting obligation just because it happens that the time limits for making a Regulation 80 determination may have expired under the TMA. So it's a continuing obligation. It's a continuing obligation. So to conclude, and this is the last thing I need to say on the retrospectivity point, there is nothing in the 7AB power to limit it to a situation in which HMRC are aware of all the facts in advance and can only operate it with prospective effect. And needless to say, if that were the correct interpretation of the power, it would very seriously curtail it. That very much, though, dependent upon what the power is, what, what you're dealing with. And you're assuming here that it's dealing with a transaction, a relationship between an end user and a tax. Sorry, and uh, an employee. Well, it's not limited, my lord. It, 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 it's, it's a wide <coughs> general power. Well, I understand that. I, I think that what, what I'd be interested to know is, is how you... What, what, what I'm interested in is that 4A quite clearly deals with... You mean 7AA? No. Oh, 4A. 4A. List, the, list item 4 List a. item 4A. Yes. Is um, 
very clearly dealing with um, the <coughs> issue of the pay and the payer. Yes, it, it's a, it's, it provides varies for the regulation. For the regulation. Yes. In particular, one would have thought Regulation 72. Yeah. When we come to 7A and reading it all together, you can see that A is dealing not with the specific relationship between one <coughs> employee and employer or end user, but the arrangements more generally. Of, well, it might be relating to one employee. Well, it might be. I agree, but it's but on its it's <coughs> but on its um, on its face, it's expressed in much more general terms, and actually makes no mention of a pay e at all. Um, and um, I think my question is wh whether or not this can be read as dealing with the. Um, the, the revenues power to make different to have different arrangements <coughs> with an or, or permit an, a, a, an employer to have different arrangements, such as not having to apply, apply the pay scheme to students, for example, whatever, rather than address to the one specific pay um, uh, situation. So it, is my is my lord language. is my lord contemplating? That in our case we're in the one individual payee category or the wide number of payee categories. The one individual category. Um, <coughs> the, well, well, the answer is looking at the language of 7AB, nothing in the PEW regulations may be read as requiring the payer, not payers generally, the yes. payer. There would only what be one payer, that's right. But my Lord, I think my Lord is asking me two questions. The first is about the difference between the singular and the general. <coughs> and the singular, the answer to the singular question is it refers to the payer. The second question I think <coughs> my Lord is putting to me is this says nothing about the payee. But the answer to that, which was identified in argument with my lady, Lady Justice Simler yesterday, is that once you disapply compliance with the regulations on the payer, that cannot be a unilateral application of the power, because um, once the collection obligation is disapplied, the primary liability under ITPA for the tax, which has always rested on the employee, then ineluctably <coughs> has to be satisfied by the employee making the relevant payment himself. Indeed, if it were otherwise, this is an important point, the well-established principle set out in cases like Preston, namely that the primary duty of the commissioners is to collect tax, not to forgive tax, would be violated. I'm not going to take you to it. <coughs> Preston is at authority, additional authorities, tab 5, page 684, letter E, Speech of Lord Templeman. Yes. So um, the effect of, and this is Mr. Mullen's argument, namely that 7AB does no more than switch off the employer's collection obligation, would mean that the employee's liability under ITPA for the tax has somehow been forgiven. And with respect, that would be a very radical interpretation <coughs> of the way in which 7A operates, because it would amount to the, um, the commissioners saying, well, we're letting, we think it's inappropriate to make collection through the payer, namely the employer. And somehow <coughs> it follows from that that we're letting the employee off his tax hook. And it's another way of putting the point to say that really the focus of 7A is on relieving the employer mm. yes. in circumstances where it's considered appropriate to do so. And that yes. tells you nothing at all about the liability of the payee. With great respect. Which you have to go back to first principles. And the underlying liability in the true stage one sense of the person in receipt of the emolument. I agree. Yes, my lord. 
I think I think my I'm, I'm sure I'm not expressing it very well. My my question is is more to do with the question whether or not seven A <coughs> should be read as dealing with decisions by the revenue <coughs> that a um, that an employer need not operate a PAY scheme more generally. Well, it not may be read that that may be one possibility contemplated or covered by. Yes. But, but that's not it, limited in that. But way. is it designed also to deal with a situation where there is he is operating a PAY scheme and and just in relation to one employee <coughs> in that scheme, um, not saying it's not appropriate unless it's appropriate for the for the, for the particular um, fact employer to operate the scheme in relation to them but but that in in relation to one particular payment obligation which arises because they are obliged because it is necessary and appropriate for them to operate the scheme generally but in relation to that particular situation um, they should be forgiven their payment obligation is my lord asking or contemplating a situation in which a um, employer or deemed employer does operate PAYE, but for one particular employee, there is some particular reason why it's inappropriate to expect compliance? Is that is that the question? Well, I think I think what I, I'm saying that, that that I suspect is not what this sec subsection is designed well, to deal with. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Yes. Uh, um, that's not this situation, particularly because the deemed employer in this case, the end users who didn't know they were deemed employers, were not operating PAYE at all. They weren't making payments of employment income. But they didn't think they were. They were paying in intermediaries. They were. They thought. They thought they were paying for services provided to them by a UK-based entity. Exactly. Sorry. And from their point of view, one of the attractions was to get away from having to operate PAYE. My lord has the point I was going to make later on. Absolutely. Indeed, if, if they were told, if they'd been told by the promoters of these tax avoidance schemes or by, or by um, uh, um, the claimants, um, I, I know you think you're getting contracts for services, but actually, because we have a section 689 situation with, with an offshore employer about whom you, we so far told you nothing, you have accounting obligations under 689, 710 and regulation 62, they would have run a mile. Yes, and one imagines if they had the faintest hint of what all this was about, exactly, <laughs> it would have been a whole load of bother which they could absolutely do without. Yeah. Well, absolutely, and, and, and 7, 7AA is dealing with a situation where um, Prospectively, the revenue says you don't need to op you don't need to make arrangements for the collection. Well, you, you can make different arrangements for the collection of the tax. Um. <coughs> yes, I'm not sure I'd accept <coughs> my lord's adjective adverb prospectively. It it might be that arrangements are made after the event. Well, the collection of tax. It, okay, but whether it's prospectively <coughs> or not, but it, that is. But it seems to me that A and B, you'd expect, were dealing with different aspects of the same problem. Well, with respect, why? I mean, they might be. They, the, you might say um, Parliament is doing something different in B to what it's doing in A. Well, you've got to try and read them together, haven't you? I'm not saying that they don't. Well, these are all these problem. are all general principles of statutory interpretation. You used them generous, or. But, but, but there's, an e there's, there's another principle of statutory interpretation that points the other way, which is that um, Parliament doesn't need to legislate twice for the same thing. Sometimes they do, sometimes they have overlapping aims and applications, see CUSAC. M my respectful submission is that you focus on 7AB and ask whether it's wide enough to cover the present situation, to which the answer is yes. <coughs> I mean, if there is a common theme, sorry to go back to a point I was making, it seems at the moment to me to be it's focusing on relieving the payer in certain types of circumstances where it might seem unreasonable or harsh for them to be lumbered with the PAYE machinery. And then there are two alternative ways um, in which that may be achieved. 
and on the face of it, one just has to read each and see if the language fits the facts. Again, I would respectfully agree. I'm, I'm anxious to deal with my Lord or Justice Phillips concern if I haven't done so so far. <coughs> no, I, I, I think I understand entirely what you're saying. Okay. <laughs> um, can I then deal with Mr. Mullen's argument based on Section 710 of ITPA? Which is legislation bundle, page 243. <coughs> In summary, Mr. Mullen says that even if the obligation to account for tax placed upon an employer in Regulation 62.5 is disapplied or can be disapplied by the 7A power. That has no effect on what Malone and Friend says is the separate obligation to account contained in section 710 sub 4. But the simple and obvious answer identified by my lady yesterday is that 710 sub 4, like 710 sub 1, has the words in it, the employer must, subject to and in accordance with PAYE regulations. And for, for your note, <coughs> those words in square brackets were also introduced by Section 145 of the Finance Act 2003. So the obligation in Section 710 sub 4 only takes effect, only has life, subject to and in accordance with <coughs> the relevant regulation, in this case the regulation in 62.5. And if the regulation, if the accounting obligation in 62.5 is switched off by the 7A power, the 710 sub 4 obligation has no independent life. And the same answer applies to Mr. Mullen's reliance in his oral submissions, although not, I think, in his skeleton, on section 222 of ITPA, legislation bundle <coughs> page 222, I've, coincidentally. This is the grossing up provision when the employee fails to make good the amount accounted for. This section applies if an employer is treated by virtue of section dot 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 six eight nine as having made a payment of income of <coughs> the employee, the notional payment. The employer is required by virtue of section 710 to account, and then you, you gross up if that applies. But if you've switched off 710 through switching off regulation six, 62, then this provision simply doesn't arise. And if I may say so, this argument, relying on section 222, is a, again a rather hollow one uh, from Mr. Mullen, given that none of the claimants ever made good the amount due to the deemed employers points I will have to return to. With all that in mind, can I ask you to look at, please, um, the orbiter observations of the upper tribunal so that I can explain why they were wrong. It's core bundle, tab 11, page 207 of the core bundle, starting at paragraph 119. I'm going to have to take you through 119, 118, I beg your pardon, and 119 quite carefully. There are two serious flaws in the reasoning in 118, which I'm going to show you. 
HMRC's counter-argument emphasizes the breadth of the 7A discretion. So does my Lord Lord Justice Henderson have the page 207 of the... Yes, I've got it now. HMRC's counter-argument emphasizes the breadth of the 7A discretion. It refers to relieving the payer's compliance with any regulation. Therefore, it can relieve the payer of the obligation to deduct in the first place, thus cutting off 185 and 188 at the pass. The argument has prompted us to reflect on the precise scope of the 7A discretion as it applies to a case such as this. So what they're purporting to do in the next few sentences is to apply it to this case, where the direction was made after the point in time where the obligation to make the deduction had already arisen, we can well see that if the obligation to deduct were relieved before the liability to deduct had occurred, 185 and 188, which envisaged there was an obligation to deduct tax, have nothing to bite on. No PAYE credit under those regs can then arise. But, and you think that they're about to describe this case, if the 7A disapplication is made after the deduction has been made, regs 185 and 188 and the credit they will give rise to will have already crystallized. Now, there are two fundamental mistakes with that sentence. The first mistake is that in this case, no deduction has ever been made by the end users, nor did those end users ever account for the tax, and nor did the claimants ever think they had done so. <coughs> Indeed, as I'll come back to under the jurisdiction argument, if the claimants had thought that such a deduction had been made or accounting had been made by their deemed employers, the end users, they would have declared that in their self-assessment returns <coughs> pursuant to Section 8, as I will come back to. So that's the first mistake. No deduction has ever been made. The second fundamental mistake is that if a deduction has in fact been made, the notional so-called credit which lies at the heart of Malone and Friend's case, namely the credit in 1855 and 1883, does not arise at all. The whole point of the so-called credit that Malone and Friend seeks to rely upon is where a deduction has not been made, but where nonetheless the employee can claim a credit of the amount that should have been deducted or should have been accounted for. So if there is an actual deduction or an actual accounting, the employee can claim the credit. I oh, beg your pardon. The, em the, 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 the If there is an actual <coughs> accounting or an actual deduction, there is no need to claim the credit which he relies upon. And there's a confusion that I'm going to come back to about this word credit, because um, the sums that have to be done in Regulation 188 at capital letter B include both actual deductions and deductions that should have been made. That's the credit bit, and I'll show that to you in due course. But just pausing for now, there are, as I say, two errors. First, that no deduction did actually take place. Secondly, if a deduction had taken place, there would be no need for the credit on which my learned friend relies. So that confusion then taints, with great respect, the rest of the upper tribunal's reasoning. And we can see that perhaps most clearly in subparagraph 119.2 where the tribunal says, so construed, the direction results in adverse retrospective effect. I've already given you my answer about why it's no more retrospective than the direction. Those adverse effects don't, of course, fall on the subject of the direction. Where the di deduction obligation is removed <coughs> after the event, the employer or person treated as employer will be relieved 
It's the employee who suffers from the removal of the deduction obligation after it's arisen. Tax that, under the law as it stood at the time, ought to have been deducted, was not. Tax which, therefore, the employee was not expecting to be liable to pay for becomes liable. But that's wrong again. The reason that the claimant employees in this case, like Mr. Hoey, were not expecting to have to pay the tax was nothing to do with the credit under 185 or 188. It was because they didn't declare the loan amounts as chargeable income in their self-assessment returns in the first place, because they presumably understood, insofar as they thought about it at all, that the scheme worked. This is pre-Rangers. Yes, and they deliberately, therefore, filled in the boxes appropriate to the charge on the benefit of the loan. Exactly. Which was what the scheme was intended to provide. Precisely so. But that has nothing to do with the credit. And therefore, um, the sentence in J, tax which, therefore, the employee was not expecting to be liable to pay for became, becomes liable, misses the point. The upper tribunal then comes back to this question. Am I going to show it to you now? In paragraph 125. <clears throat> they say, it might also be argued that any retrospective effect on Mr. Hoey's access to a PAYE credit should not be viewed as prejudicing him, or at least not in a way that should elicit concern. The way the scheme was organized or so that no tax on a large part of his remuneration was payable. It just happens that following the Rangers case, the tax did become payable. However, the point about retrospection is a broader one. It's not tied to Mr. Hoey or those in a similar position, but arises from the wording of the provision. But with great respect, that, that misunderstands the principles of law in relation to retrospectivity. What the upper tribunal seems to be saying here is that irrespective of the facts, the possibility that 7A might in some cases operate unfairly, I don't really know what they would be, um, it must be narrowly and prospectively only construed in all cases, even if a retrospective application doesn't operate unfairly in this case. But that's entirely inconsistent with the principles of retrospective application and interpretation. And indeed, and this is a key point, the whole point of 7A requires the officer to consider what is appropriate. And part of what is appropriate may be retrospective unfairness. So if in a particular case, it can be said that exercising the 7A power in whatever context it arises creates retrospective unfairness or some other species of unfairness, that will be a pointer towards not exercising the power and potentially a ground for judicial review. But you can't turn the proper operation of the retrospectivity principles on its head and say, because in some cases we can't identify <coughs> this power might operate retrospectively. It can't operate that way in this case. And in, on the facts of this case, where the end users knew nothing about the arrangements, and where the claimants never even claimed the credit in the first place, they never claimed the credit in the first place, because they never believed the tax on the loan should have been deducted or accounted for, there was no unfairly retrospective exercise of the power. <coughs> So the issue of potential retrospectivity goes to the exercise of the power. It's not a reason for construing the values given to the revenue in an area of fashion. Yes, my lord. Can I now turn to the reasoning of the upper tribunal back in paragraph 119, sub 3, on page 208 of the bundle? This is another um, 
set of reasons they give. They say the statutory scheme makes no provision for notice and imposes no conditions in contrast to the direction regulations. These show that where the legislation alters the default framework, it does so on a conditioned basis and with protections. And that echoes something that Malone Friend argues in his skeleton, where he says, well, there's no equivalent safeguards, no rights of appeal, no obligations to give notice, et cetera. To which the answer is as follows. As to rights of appeal, the procedural provisions of the regulations do give obligations or entitlements to rights of appeal on very specific grounds corresponding to the grounds upon which the directions were made in <clears> the first place. By contrast, the grounds of challenge available to the exercise of a 7A discretion are potentially much wider. They encompass all the common law grounds of challenge, Hadfield, legitimate expectation, irrationality, etc. And Parliament has chosen not to grant a right of appeal against the 7A power and can be taken to have understood that therefore judicial review would be appropriate. There's no purported attempt to exclude the judicial review jurisdiction. Indeed, if such a attempt were constitutionally effective, but there isn't one. So um, the absence of a specific right of appeal does not mean that the taxpayer is left in a procedurally unfair position. He can challenge the exercise of the power in this case, indeed on broader grounds than would be available on an ordinary appeal, precisely as Mr. Mullen has done in this claim for judicial review. You say it's broader, but it wouldn't encompass a merits challenge. But what, what, what does my lady mean by a merits challenge? So can, can we just, so uh, um, in, a no, in, a, in a challenge to notional payments, can we have a look um, at, 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 at the conditions? So yes, a, I'm sure the point is, I mean, any review is basically confined to examining the reasonableness of, what, of the opinion of the view which the officer has formed. I would respectfully accept that. And it's not, therefore, for the, for the court hearing the JR to second guess the exercise of that power, provided that none it's of the normal public law principles have been infringed. I would respectfully accept that. But can we, can we just look at what the right of appeal might be mm. on the exercise of a Regulation 81 direction? Because it's narrower, not wider. If we turn back to the legislation, <clears throat> so my, if we start please with um, regulation 81, page 319. <clears throat> Condition A in 81.2, which enables a direction to be made <coughs> and which covers a deduction case, condition A is that the revenue are of the opinion that the employee in respect of whose relevant payments the determination was made has received those payments knowing that the employer has willfully failed to deduct the amount of tax that should have been deducted. Condition B is that the unpaid tax represents an amount for which the employer was required to account under regulation 62.5. So not hedged around with anything that the employer may or may not have known or done or acted. Now we look at the right of appeal, page 320, capital C, regulation 81A. one a one an employee may appeal against the direction dot, 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 C, specifying the grounds of appeal. Two, for the purposes of paragraph one, the grounds of appeal are dot, 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 B, in relation to condition B, that's notional payments, the relevant payment was not a notional payment. That's the ground of appeal. That's not a merits appeal. That's a 
very narrow question of what is or is not a notional payment. The grounds of appeal do not encompass, should the officer have exercised <coughs> his power to make the direction, which is why I said that the JR challenge is wider, not narrower. And is one to infer that by this narrow specification of the grounds, that's impliedly meant to oust any JR challenge? Well, can I, can, can I leave that for another day? <laughs> for another day yeah. um, I'm sure your clients would like the answer. I'm sure my clients would like the answer to be <laughs> yes. Uh, um, um, there, there might be interesting arguments um, in, in that context. Sorry, that was a bit of a red herring. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a fair question, but I'm going to fairly not answer yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's right of appeal. As to um, the notice requirements, it's true that um, the revenue has to give notice of a direction to the employee. But the revenue, as part of its public law duty to act in a procedurally fair way in exercising the 7A power, has put in place in its policy both the CIP guidance and the manual, the requirement to give the taxpayer employee the chance to make representation. So it has to tell them what it's proposing to do and ask them to say whatever they want to, which is exactly what happened in this case. That's for your reference. CIP guidance notes, JR Bundle, page 39. <coughs> Avoidance handling process manual, JR Bundle, page 100. Um, uh, that completes what I want to say about the upper tribunal's obiter reasoning about the scope of 7A. I'm going to come on in a moment to dealing with the public law arguments, legitimate expectation, irrelevant considerations, etc. Before I do, can I finally turn to the territoriality point? This is 6891C. Yes. And, and my lady will recall that I rose to ask whether it was being advanced in the appeal or the JR or both. And I think the answer was both. Yeah. I'm going to deal with them in each context. Insofar as the point is being advanced on this second appeal, FTT, Upper Tribunal Court of Appeal. It is something that my learned friend could and should have raised at first instance. In particular, so that the tribunal could have made relevant findings of fact if it was in dispute. Well, Mr. Mullen, the way he's now advancing it... it is, is the pure point of pure law. Point I'm going to law. come to the pure okay. point of law. It wasn't clear, and I'm going to show you this, yeah. until his oral submissions, what this point was. Yeah. Indeed, on the contrary, I'm, going to, I'm sorry to be pedantic, but his skeleton argument suggested it was a completely different point. Yeah. I'm going to show that to you. So, if the point was going to be advanced in the statutory appeal along the lines that Mr. Mullen's skeleton dealt with it, then it should have been done in the tribunal so that the tribunal could have made findings of fact about whether Penfolds or Hamilton Trust had a UK presence. Penfold was an Isle of Man employer. Hamilton Trust was the Guernsey employer. The appellants did not advance any such argument below. And for your note, the appellant's detailed statement of case in the tribunal is at supplementary bundle for the statutory appeal tab 10. No suggestion that Penfolds or Hamilton had a UK trading presence. So on that basis, it's quite impossible to see how on a second appeal to this court, 
any relevant error of law has been made. I'll come on in any event to deal with the pure point of law, but I am taking a procedural point at the outset. I'm also going to take a procedural point at the outset in relation to the claim for judicial review because it is not a point advanced anywhere in the judicial review grounds. And I'm going to take you later to the judgment of Lord Justice Singh with the agreement of the Lord Chief Justice about the need for procedural rigor in judicial review cases in the Dolan case. He's <clears throat> flagging it up for now. Can I just show you first, however, the grounds of challenge, the JR grounds of challenge, that's core bundle, tab 19, starting at page 362. In particular, paragraph 5.3, under summary of the background facts. It's my lady C, paragraph 5.3. In the arrangements which are the subject of this claim, the employers are non-UK resident entities who paid part of the claimant's remuneration to a trust. Now, I accept that doesn't say had no UK presence, but there's no hint that they did, after all, have a UK presence. That's paragraph 5.3. Then paragraph 13 identifies the Clark and Oceanic Authority. Paragraph 13, in Clark and Oceanic, it was held that the territorial scope of the code was limited to persons with sufficient tax presence in the UK. Paragraph 17, the person liable to pay the tax in respect of the earnings paid under the arrangements was either the employer or the end user HMRC determined that the employer, that's Penfolds or Hamilton, is not within the territorial scope of the code, but has decided not to collect tax from the end user. But, and then in all the grounds that follow, there is no hint of any challenge to that determination. So that was the JR claim form issued in August 2019. The first time the claimants sought to argue that the employers, that's the end users, no, I beg your pardon. No, the employers. The employers, um, Penfolds and Hamilton, might not have a UK tax presence. Might have one. Might have, I beg you, I'm getting myself confused. Um, might have one. Was in his skeleton argument in this court, served almost nine years after his appeal was advanced in the tax tribunal and two and a half years after his JR claim was commenced. And even then, he made a very different point to the one he sought to advance on his feet for the first time yesterday. Could you turn to his skeleton argument, please? Core bundle, tab one, page 10. <coughs> no. Yes, pay, uh, um, I beg your pardon. Pay, yes, core bundle page 10, paragraphs 35 and 30, well, 33 to 36. So in 33, starting on page 9, he refers to the Clark and Oceanic Authority. Paragraph 34 says the position of the employers doesn't appear to have been properly addressed <coughs> by HMRC. On the contrary, Mr. McFarlane's evidence appears to suggest he's unclear. Well, no, it didn't. This is highly relevant because if the employers have a tax presence in the UK, then the majority of the issues in these proceedings are moot. That's because the end users will never have been liable to account. As such, nothing which the revenue have done can have any effect on any of the claimant's tax positions. <coughs> the claimants had understood that the revenue had properly considered and investigated this issue. I think that's an attempt to excuse why he's not raising this until very late in the day. But it's apparent from the evidence of McFarlane, Mr. McFarlane, that this is not the case. Having regard to the nature of the employer's trade, and this is the key bit, providing a workforce in the UK to UK-based end users, and the fact that they operated PYE, it appears they do have a tax presence. So his argument there is focused on 
the correct Clark and Oceanic test. Do they have a UK trade presence? Not. They have surrendered themselves to the jurisdiction of the UK by voluntarily operating PAYE. Faced with that late argument, Could you read the uh, my learned friend would like me to read paragraphs 37 and 38. Could I ask my lady and lords to read that? Faced with that late argument, um, one of the matters covered in Mr. McFarlane's second witness statement was the territoriality point, although he touched on it uh, um, before. Could I ask the court to take back up the JR bundle um, page 177? The, the, the ground is covered in some detail between paragraphs 4 and 14. And in due course, I'd invite the court to look back at Mr. McFarlane's evidence contained in these paragraphs, where he explains why he formed the view that Penfold and Hamilton did not have a UK trading presence. I'm not going to spend time going through it now. What I'd, like you, what I'd like to do instead is to take you to the underlying documents that he refers to so we can see why he ended up in the conclusion that he did. Just, just, just before we do, if, if this is a matter that would have required investigation of the facts and findings of facts... Yes, in the tribunal. In the tribunal. Yes. Then it's difficult to see how or why this new point should be permitted. Certainly not in the context of a second appeal. No. In the context of a judicial review claim, it would have been open to the claimants to adduce detailed evidence about the functioning of all these arrangements. And you say all there is is what uh, Mr. McFarlane Yeah, I mean, says. again, at the risk of banging the same drum I banged yesterday, one of the most conspicuous features of the claimant's case is their complete failure to explain the arrangements. Sorry? No, no, I'm talking about in this claim for judicial review. My only friend says, did they fail to explain it in the first tier tax tribunal? Well, as um, Ms. Nathan may need to develop in the context of her submissions, Mr. Hoey was cross-examined at some length, as were the other witnesses, about how these arrangements were. And even at the end of that cross-examination, it was pretty opaque. Anyway. Um, can I take you, please, to some of the underlying documents in the same bundle, starting at page 156. This is the DOTAS disclosure document for the Penfold iteration of the scheme. You can see that from the covering letter. And then if you turn over to 157, under the heading in the last box, summary of proposals or arrangements. Does my lady and my lord see that? <clears throat> An Isle of Man company is established which will provide contractors to deliver, employed by the Isle of Man company to deliver IT and other services. The Isle of Man company establishes an employee benefit trust and <coughs> benefits. And then over the page, First bullet point, an Isle of Man company is established which will be resident in the Isle of Man for tax purposes and will not trade in the UK. Couldn't be clearer. And the same point arises for Hamilton. See page 160, DOTAS form, last box on page 160. An offshore entity will employ individuals. The offshore entity will not have a UK presence or be resident in the UK. And the point is made again over the page, fourth line down in the first box, 
Class A NICs will not be payable on these loans as the employer has no UK residence or presence. Until I heard Melinda Friend's submissions yesterday, I thought his point was going to be it was irrational for Mr. McFarlane to come to the view that he did, that there was no UK presence. Well, that would have been a hopeless argument in light of this evidence. Uh, as to the pure point of law, assuming he has permission to run it, there is no authority that Mr. Mullen pointed to, nor none that I am aware of, that if you voluntarily operate PAYE offshore in respect of part of an employee's earnings, that means you have surrendered to the jurisdiction of the PAYE regime on the rest. Indeed, if that had been the position, these schemes wouldn't have worked, certainly not in the way that they were hoped to work. Otherwise, why go to the trouble of making the employers offshore in the first place? And the test in Clark and Oceanic offers no support, indeed is contrary to this novel concept of surrender to the jurisdiction. The test in Clark and Oceanic is whether the relevant employer has a trading presence in the United Kingdom. And for your note, that is clear from the speech of Lord Scarman at pages, page 145, letters E to F, and the speech of Lord Wilberforce at page 153, <coughs> capital B. We need to take you to it. So that is all I want to say about the territoriality argument. This may be a slight tangent, but at some point I'm quite interested in why it was that the, the, the partial compliance with PAYE was inserted into the scheme, and what was the point of that? <laughs> Was it just to give you the veneer of respect? I, I expect so. I expect it would be to give precisely so, to say, well, we're, we're operating. I think some of them, in fact, can I, can I go back to some of the marketing material? Because that may yes. give the answer. Uh, um, some of it rather confusing, to put it kindly. Um, One thing that I scratched my head about when I first saw it. Quite often the way with these marketing materials. I saw somewhere, maybe it was in something that came from the dungeon. No, no, it's not right. Where, sorry, where is which bundle do we find the marketing stuff in? Start, it starts with the previous iteration of the scheme yes. at page 140 of the JR Thank you. bundle. Maybe that I saw it somewhere in another document that was not. Or is it in the statutory oh, That's it. That's it. Oh, great. Um, thank you. Uh, if you put away that bundle and turn up the statutory appeal bundle. The supplementary, the supplementary statutory appeal bond. If you turn to tab two, yeah. Okay. So um, tab two is some marketing material for an entity called Probiz, which I am 
poll was associated with the Penfold scheme. Um, if you turn to page 5, under the heading Contractors, under the third paragraph, you will be an employee and all your income will be subject to ITPA. What can we offer? Take home pay targeted at 80% of gross after taxes and all costs. Removal of IR35 risk, inheritance tax savings. I think the inheritance tax savings are to do with the debt left in your estate when you pass away on the, lo on the, un on the unpaid part of the loan. That's one reason why the loans are genuine. Yes, although it was part of the plan. I I'm not trying to make a sham argument, no. but, but the loans were never called on. Oh, no. Um, and then on the next page, and this is the clearest answer to um, my Lord's question. If you look under, uh, pay, in page six, in the bullet points, one, two, three, four, five, five bullet points down, no income paid to the contractor is outside PAYE. And then the same point arises in the Penfold's Employee Information Guide. Please see tab 4, page 13, paragraph 4, summary of salary package income and benefits. For those employees working and living in the UK, Penfold's will pay a UK salary that is subject to the statutory PAYE deductions and NICs. And the third paragraph under that same heading, we also make contributions to the EBT and directors of Penfolds make recommendations to the trustee into how, in relation to how those contributions could be used. The trustees consider these recommendations and may use the contributions to confer discretionary benefits, namely the loans. So I think that answers, I hope that answers my Lord's question. Yes, well, I mean, it's certainly seems to be designed to sort of heighten the contrast between PAYE regulation, sorry, PAYE compliance in relation to remuneration and what until Rangers was regarded as yes. quite separate arrangements made in relation which didn't involve any receipt in the sense that that term had been understood. Rather than redirected Rather earnings than as redirected. the Supreme Court found. Precisely. Yes, sorry, thank you very much. I think that was I knew I'd seen it somewhere. A useful diversion, at least for me. <laughs> Can I now turn to the public law arguments? And I notice it's quarter to 11. Quarter past. Is my watch running hard? No, no, oh, no, yeah. no, no. You want me to stop yes. at quarter past? OK. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my battery had stopped. <laughs> I told, I'm sorry, I can't help telling you this. Um, <laughs> when I got home last night, I told my wife how embarrassed I was at Lord Justice Phillips' question about Mitty, and I'd never heard of it. She said, oh, come on, Sam, you must have heard of Mitty. And then she sent me an, uh, um, a, a post from The Guardian this morning saying apparently some regulators called, called in uh, um, investigators into Mitty this morning, which I thought was something of a coincidence. But anyway, that's by the by. <laughs> um, can I start, please, with the allegation that there has been a breach of the duty of <coughs> candor and what is said to follow from that? Essentially, the argument proceeds in the following steps. One, the grounds of challenge were drafted without knowing about the existence of the CIP guidance. Two, various factors which the grounds said were relevant or irrelevant considerations in the officer's exercise of the power should or should not have been taken into account in the CIP's formulation of the policy. Three, the revenue have not given proper disclosure of all records relating to the formulation of the policy, and that's a breach of the duty of candor. Four, one can therefore draw an adverse inference that relevant matters were not taken into account and irrelevant matters were taken into account. That's how I think it's put. And there are several flaws in that argument. The first is that the correct target of any challenge in this claim for judicial review is the decision of the officers who were the decision makers. 
The question is whether they, who exercised the discretion, took into account all relevant and no irrelevant measures. <coughs> And by relevant, I mean mandatorily relevant in the cartoon Wensbury sense. Uh, and by irrelevant, I mean no mandatorily irrelevant matters in the Wensbury sense. So, as I say, <clears throat> the first point is that it is the officer's decision that should be under challenge because the guidance makes clear that it's ultimately up to the officers to exercise their discretion on all the circumstances of the case, albeit taking into account, of course, the guidance. <clears throat> Secondly, at the risk of banging the same drum, no application has been made to amend the grounds of challenge which do not challenge the guidance. And so there is no formulation of what it is that is said now to be unlawful about the guidance in any ground of challenge. And the difficulty is this, and it's not just a dry technical point. Although Mr. Mullen made a number of submissions yesterday about what he claimed were deficiencies in the guidance and deficiencies in the and, uh, avoidance handling process manual, um, we on this side of the court, well certainly I, found it very difficult to understand precisely what public law arguments were being made about the deficiencies in those documents. <clears throat> and this is where I go back to the point made by Lord Justice Singh in the Dolan case, where he emphasised the need for procedural rigour in judicial review claims, and where he deprecated the practice of what he called rolling judicial reviews with moving targets. You've got to know what it is that you're defending as a defendant. <clears throat> and to give you the <clears throat> reference, it's additional authorities, tab 13, judgment of Lord Justice Singh with the agreement of the Lord Chief Justice, and I've forgotten who the third member of the court was. That's very disrespectful. Hold on. Lady Justice King. Um, paragraphs 116 to 118. And a, a West law search for Dolan since it was decided reveals lots of cases where it's been applied. So that's my second answer. The first answer is correct target is decision of the officers. <coughs> second procedural answer is no application to the amend the JR grounds to formulate what it is that is unlawful about the guidance. Third, even to the extent that the guidance may be a legitimate target of the JR challenge, and this is perhaps the key point, the lawfulness of that guidance must be judged on its face. Either on its face it does take into account mandatorily irrelevant considerations, or fails to take into account mandatorily relevant considerations, or it does not. That, that is a question for interpretation of the guidance and does not require one to go back in time and examine the deliberations of the panel, which ended up with the formulation of the guidance. And so we do not accept that there was any duty of candor to disclose all records of the discussions that led up to the formulation of the guidance. And there is no authority at all for the proposition that whenever a JR challenge is brought to a policy or to a decision which gives effect to a policy in particular cases, candor requires the public authority to disclose all documents recording the discussions leading to the making of the policy. Now, of course, my, my lady and my lords, there, there might be a case where um, Candor might require something. So let's say um, one of the members of the panel had a corrupt motive for wanting to punish a particular person over whom the panel uh, exercised regulatory power. That would be something that candor would require one to disclose. It's obvious why. But, but candor doesn't require a general CPR, um, old-fashioned style disclosure obligation. 
before the restrictions of that CPR Peruvian guano approach in the Chancery Division and, and Commercial Court. But leaving that, that's not what the duty of candor requires. And how far would such a requirement go? If, if Mr. Um, Mullen is right, what, why not extend it to a fishing expedition for all the emails that individual members of the panel would have had with their teams beforehand? I mean, to impose such a duty would be a considerable disincentive for the proper and responsible formulation of policy, one might think, which requires an ability for the officials concerned to communicate between themselves in the process of considering the pros and cons. Indeed. What may turn out to be blind alleys and what may turn out to be good ideas and so forth. I mean, the interests of good administration are in the production of a policy, yes. not in the process that leads to that policy. And the interest of... Uh, uh, Justice, which is the ultimate test for the duty of candor as set out by the House of Lords in Tweed and Parades Commission, an authority that lies at the heart of the modern <coughs> of the duty of candor, but is not in the authorities bundle, does not require you to give uh, a very old-fashioned Peruvian guano-style disclosure. So that deals with the duty of candor. Can I now turn to address whether there was indeed, <clears throat> on the face of the decisions, any public law error? In the pleaded grounds of challenge, paragraphs 38 and 39, six factors are relied upon. Five of these, I'm going to come back to the five, are allegations of failing to take into account relevant considerations. One of them, Paragraph 39 is a complaint that the decision maker took into account an irrelevant consideration. Can we just turn that up? It's JR Bundle, page 370. No, that can't be right. My lady in law gives me a is it core, It's core bundle. Oh, yes, it's core bundle. You're quite right. Yes, I've put CB, so yes, my lady is right. Core bundle, page 370. Hey, paragraph 39, where it is said, the essence of the decision was the assumption, I, I would say legitimate inference, but that's how he puts it. The essence of the decision was the assumption that end users were not aware of the arrangements. However, given the nature of the statutory schemes, that was an irrelevant factor. Why? He says it was incumbent on the end users to be aware of their statutory obligations in hiring staff, including knowing from whom they were <coughs> hiring them. You think it might be equally incumbent on an employee to tell his employer what's going on or the revenue when they ask you what's going on. But in any event, that assertion of a Wensbury irrational, irrelevant factor is hopeless. When deciding whether to exercise the 7A power concerning whether it is inappropriate to require an end user to comply with PAYE obligations, how can the end user's knowledge of what it was supposed to do, or lack of knowledge of what it was supposed to do, possibly be an irrelevant matter, still less a Wensbury irrational irrelevant matter. Um, so far as I understood it, Mr. Mullen yesterday sought to make a somewhat different point when he criticized what was said by Mr. McFarlane in paragraph 44 of his first statement. Um, that is in the JR bundle, page 28. If we look at the top of the page of page 28, this is where Mr. McFarlane is going through each of the grounds in the statement of grounds. <coughs> alleged failure to contact any of the claimants to determine whether the end users were aware of the arrangement. 
He says, as I've already explained above, I did invite the co-claimants to provide details of their end users' knowledge. As I've also explained, Mr. Finch also invited Mr. Coey to do so. So far as I'm aware, to date, none of the claimants have provided any statement or evidence that their end users were party to or had direct knowledge of the avoidance arrangement. I did not contact the end users. As it was my understanding that the end users had not required the claimants to use the arrangements, I considered they wouldn't have known that any loans were in fact earning, even if they were aware of the loans at all. I considered that they would reasonably have concluded they were not required to operate PAYE, see below, and I was of the view I didn't need to contact them. I considered it to be for the claimants to evidence any assertion about the end user's knowledge. <coughs> I think, but I'm genuinely not sure, that Mr. Mullen's point is that in the context of a policy which required focus on whether the end users were aware of the arrangements, it was irrelevant, this is the point I think he made yesterday, it was irrelevant for Mr. McFarlane to take into account whether the end users would have known whether they had to operate PAYE arrangements. I think that's what he said to my lady. I think it is. Um, if that is the argument, I confess I fail to understand it. How can it be irrelevant when deciding under the 7A power, whether it's inappropriate for end users to have complied with their PAYE obligations, how can it be irrelevant in considering that question to consider whether the end user knew it had to operate them? Do you think that was precisely the question you had to ask, or at least one of them? Um, but that, that's the only pleaded ground and another iteration of it, um, a different iteration of taking into account irrelevant considerations. Um, as to the series of failures to take into account so-called relevant considerations, for your note, those were set out in JR Grounds paragraphs 38.1 to 38.5. Most of them were not pursued yesterday. Um, but for your note, we dealt with each of them seriatim in the detailed grounds of defense at paragraphs 76 to 85. I'm not going to take up time because they weren't pursued. Two points specifically were made, and these are the last two points I think I need to deal with under the public law limb of the case. Um, but they both link to other arguments made elsewhere in the skeleton. The first is what Milena Friend says is Mr. McFarlane's failure to follow the avoidance handling process manual about whether the end users had exercised reasonable due diligence. Um, the evidential answer to that assertion is contained in the witness statements, both of them, of Mr. Um, McFarlane. <clears throat> but I invite you to read in due course um, paragraphs 20 to 27 of his reread, paragraphs 20 to 27 of the second witness statement. Can I just focus on two of the passages for now? at page 181 of the JR Bundle. <clears throat> Starting at paragraph 24. Regarding the second quote in the guidance, it is my view that the facts and my knowledge of the arrangement are sufficient to reasonably demonstrate that an end user Exercising reasonable due diligence couldn't have been aware that they were required to operate PAYE. This is specifically set out in my first witness statement. If a thorough due diligence process could have revealed to the end user the full contractual chain of the arrangements here, which in my respectful submission is a very big if, including the existence of the multiple intermediaries um, and also the existence of an offshore employer, what the end users might have found out, as the revenue did, is that the offshore employers operated PAYE by deducting tax and NICs from their employees' salaries, 
and declared payment of beneficial loans for their employees for the revenue. Having found that, the end user might have checked HMRC's guidance, which would have told them that because the employer had operated POYE, <coughs> Section 689 did not automatically apply. In short, a due diligence process that revealed all of the facts would have allowed the end user to, be, to reasonably conclude they didn't need to operate POYE. Um, I note that as I observe in preparing an internal response to Mr. Hoey's claim for JR, and he exhibits it, despite his direct involvement with the arrangements, he was largely unaware of the role of the offshore employers in the arrangements, transcript day two, page 125 and following, and that's in the bundle. Um, it's reasonable to conclude that outsiders such as end users would have had even less understanding of the arrangements. And then paragraph 27. Um, that, so that's the evidential answer. And with that in mind, can we look at the legal test as to the duty of inquiry as a matter of common law on a public authority? The short point that I'm going to make by reference to the authority of campaign against the arms trade is that the degree of intensity of what can colloquially or not colloquially be called a Thameside inquiry is challengeable only on Wensbury grounds. <clears throat> that is authorities bundle. If it, just, just to give you a page reference, you know I gave you the, the, the trend. It's, it's unagreed, uh, HMRC's unagreed bundle, tab AI, page nine. It, that, that's the reference to Mr. Hoey's. That's the reference to the cross examination yes. of Mr. Hoey, where he Paragraph basically. Can, can somebody show it to me? And that would not have been part of the officer's knowledge at the time that the officer no. exercised the power. It's no. just a, an additional point. It, it's an additional the, point. The real points are in 25 and 27. Yes. Uh, um, <laughs> So I'm now about to show you authority for the proposition that the degree of intensity of an inquiry is challengeable only on Wensbury grounds. That is authorities bundle tab 39. Judgment of the court given by Sir Terence Etherton, Master of the Rolls, with the agreement of Lord Justices Owen and Singh. If you turn these to page 1094 of a bundle, which is 5783 of the weekly law report. Paragraph 58. Fourthly, a specific application of the doctrine of irrationality, which is invoked by CAAT, Campaign Against Arbitration, <coughs> in the present case, is the duty recognised by the courts ever since Thameside to take reasonable steps on the decision maker to acquaint himself with the relevant information in order to answer the question which he has to answer. The general principles on the Thameside duty were summarised by the Divisional Court. They have recently been approved by the Court of Appeal in Balajigari and the Home Secretary in the following way. And in due course, I'd invite you to read that whole indented passage. But can I just look at, pick it up at letter F? Subject, secondly, subject to a Wensbury challenge, it is for the public body and not the court to decide upon the manner and intensity <coughs> of the inquiry to be undertaken, see Catoon, Lord Justice, Lord. Thirdly, the court should not intervene merely because it considers that further inquiries would have been sensible or desirable. It should intervene only if no reasonable authority could have been satisfied on the basis of the inquiries made that it possessed the information necessary for its decision. And in my respectful submission, applying that test, it cannot possibly be said that the officers, Mr. McFarlane, etc., acted Wensbury irrationally in not making further inquiries to enable them to answer the question that they had to answer. The last public law ground is Mr. Mullen's argument that there was a legitimate expectation, which he describes as procedural, 
arising from the compliance operational guidance, which can be found in authorities bundle page 2214, tab 75. My first response is that the argument based upon this guidance fails to meet the threshold test identified by Lord Bingham in MFK of containing a clear and unambiguous statement devoid of any relevant qualification. Because what would it have to say? It would have to say, essentially, we will not, we promise not to use the 7A power in the current circumstances. Well, this guidance does not say that. It doesn't even mention the 7A power. That's one reason why it doesn't pass MFK first base. The second reason it doesn't pass MFK first base is because it expressly is dealing with a different situation arising from the Demiborn case. See second paragraph of the guidance at the bottom of the page. These issues relate to a situation in which income tax has been paid to HMRC on PAYE income, but by the wrong legal person. But that's nothing to do with this case. We haven't had income tax paid by anybody. <coughs> so I would not accept that the guidance can possibly have generated a legitimate expectation that the revenue would never use the 7A power conferred by primary legislation to relieve employers in appropriate circumstances of their collection obligations under the regulation. Indeed, if that had been what HMRC were purporting to do, then as my Lord, Lord Justice Phillips correctly said yesterday, those employers might have had a public law complaint about the revenue fettering their own discretion in the exercise of the 7A power. Indeed, there might even be a question about whether the revenues promised to that effect, assuming such a promise had ever been made, was ultra vires. So, I don't know of a case where it's been upheld that the revenue or any other public authority can say, we've been given a power by Parliament. We'll never exercise it. Well, prima facie, it must be unlawful. Yes. You would have thought it's so. in the force, and it's on the statute book. It's yeah. the duty of the revenue to apply the law. Indeed. You could say, we'll rarely exercise it, but uh, um, we, 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 we will do so in exceptional circumstances. Um, even that might be a bit risky. Even that might be a bit risky, depending on whether... Anyway. But it would all, anyway, it would all depend. It would all depend. Yes. So, so the, the more general point is that the MFK test is deliberately set at a very high level, and it's really only in most exceptional cases that the revenue can preclude themselves from applying the law. Indeed. And, of course, we know it can and does happen occasionally, but, I mean, they're, they're very, very rare. But, oh, luckily, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so that's the MFK first base point. Secondly, as my lady uh, <coughs> discussed in argument with Mr. Mullen yesterday, even if the guidance did generate an expectation, the test is, was there an abuse of power in acting inconsistently with it? And the answer to that question is manifestly no. M Mr. Mullen rightly does not suggest that the claimants ever relied upon this guidance. And he says, well, re detrimental reliance is not an essential ingredient or an essential precondition to the arising of a procedural legitimate expectation. But um, detrimental reliance is highly relevant to the abuse of power 
question. And that is clear from the decision of this court, in particular the judgment of Lady Justice Rose, as she then was, in the A.O. Zora <coughs> GMAC case, uh, um, tab 42, page 1,333, paragraphs 43 to 49. I'm not going to take up time going through it. So even if this guidance met the MFK first phase test, in the absence of any reliance upon it, it could not possibly be an abuse of power for the revenue then to exercise their 7A power on the facts of these cases. And that is all I want to say, subject to questions from the court, about the claim for judicial review. I'm next going to go to jurisdiction, but given the time, maybe that's a good time for a break. <coughs> I think it is. Thank you very much. So we will uh, have a 10-minute break today.
Am I going slowly enough? Yes, fine, thank you. Thank you. Good. Jurisdiction. Jurisdiction. Can I start, as I did with the JR claim, by identifying the common ground? One, the first tier tax tribunal is a creature of statute, and its jurisdiction must therefore be determined by the scope of any appellate function conferred on it by legislation. Two, the tribunal has no general supervisory jurisdiction to consider public law arguments founded in common law. See BT Trustees, tab 27, page 709, paragraph 142 per Lord Justice Patton. Three, no express right of appeal has been conferred by any legislation in relation to the revenues exercise of the 7A power, nor in relation to the availability or unavailability of the credit under regulations 185 and 188. Four, thus the only potentially relevant right of appeal is that under section 31 Taxes Management Act which is a provision concerned with appeals against closure notices and assessments, including discovery assessments. Five, Mr. Mullen rightly accepted yesterday that matters arising at what I might call Whitney Stage 3 under Sections 59, Capital A and Capital B which are concerned with collection, do not fall within the scope of an appeal under Section 31. So six, finally, it is common ground that the critical question turns on whether the credit arising under Regs 185 and 188 form part of the amounts payable under the assessment, as Mr. Mullen submits, or as we submit, and as the upper tribunal found, 
are only relevant to the subsequent Whitney Stage 3 collection issue. I hope that's a helpful starting point. Um, the answer to that critical question is to be found, must be found, in the language of the relevant legislation. And while there might be policy reasons why it would be a good idea to have the FTT as a one-stop shop, that would be a matter for Parliament to achieve, not for courts through interpretation. Can I start in with Regulation 185? Now, for forensic reasons, Mr. Mullen understandably started with 188 because it doesn't contain the express <coughs> limitation to the relevance of um, 59A and B, but, and I'm going to deal with 188 in some detail. But starting with Regulation 185, or for legislation bundle. page 323. The key point, which is fatal to the Leonard Friends case, is that as the heading makes clear, and as the opening words of the section, the regulation make clear in subparagraphs 1 and 2, the regulation applies for a specific purpose, namely that identified in subregulation 1A and 1B, namely for the purpose of determining the excess mentioned in 59A1 and the difference mentioned in section 59B1, namely the difference between tax contained in the self assessment and the aggregate of payments on account or deducted at source. Now, given that Mr. Mullen accepted that matters relating to the payment obligations contained in 59A and B TMA are not within the tribunal's jurisdiction, as I said a moment ago, the limitation of the relevance of Regulation 185 to the matters arising in Sections 59A and B is fatal unless he can find a way around it. In his skeleton argument, though not orally yesterday, Mr. Mullen sought to overcome the express limitation by operation of what he called the deeming principle in Marshall and Kerr. Can we look at that? Um, it might be helpful not to put the legislation bundle too far away, um, but to take up the authorities bundle or additional authorities bundle, I beg your pardon. Tab seven. Page 91 of the bundle, 164 of the appeal cases report. Where Lord Brown Wilkinson approved the leading <coughs> judgment of Mr. Justice Peter Gibson in the indented passage between letters E and G. Could I just invite the court to read that? So it's page 91 of the bundle, 164 of the report, letters E to G. critical sentence which Mr. Mullen cites in his skeleton is the last one. I further bear in mind that because one must treat as real that which is only deemed to be so, one must treat as real the consequences and incidents inevitably flowing from or accompanying that deemed state of affairs and is prohibited from doing so. There are two reasons why that principle does not support Mr. Mullen's case. First, 
it cannot be said that the inevitable consequence of anything in Regulation 185 is that it must be read contrary to the opening words as applying for the purposes of the assessment stage, that's Whitney stage two, rather than the collection stage in 59A and B, Whitney stage three. Second, and this is basically the same point, there's a clear prohibition on such a deeming because Regulation 185 is expressly stated to be for the limited purposes of 59A and B, which shows clearly the intention to limit the scope in that way. For your note, the most recent authority on the principles governing deeming provisions, I'm not going to take you to it, is the Supreme Court decision in the Fowler case. That's Authorities Bundle, tab 54, page 1697, paragraph 27, Judgment of Lord Briggs. But um, our, our, the submissions I've just made are consistent with the principles <coughs> uh, identified. And that's all I need to say, at least for the time being, about Regulation 185. Can I then turn to Regulation 188? put away the additional authorities for the moment and take back the legislation bundle. Where Mr. Mullen makes the point that unlike 185, it's not limited to um, 59 A and B. But there's a clear answer to that, which is that 59A and B operate in the context of self-assessments and amendments to those self-assessments by closure notices, whereas Regulation 188 is expressly concerned with other categories of assessment, including in particular discovery assessments. And as I will show you, and it's going to take a, a degree of careful unpacking, the upper tribunal was entirely correct to find, as it did, that Regulation 188 works in the same way as Regulation 185 in the context of discovery assessments. And in particular, the key point is that like Regulation 185, it does not affect the amount of tax payable under the assessment itself. And we can see that throughout, but just to start, please, with subparagraphs one and two. In this regulation, assessment means an assessment other than one under section T9 of TMA. And then there's an important term the tax payable by the employee. So that, that is the collection payment duty. That's Whitney stage three. The tax payable by the employee is A minus B minus C, where A is the tax payable under the assessment. So that shows you immediately that Whitney stage three tax payable is not the same as the tax payable under the assessment. They are two different concepts. B is the total net tax deducted. That's actually deducted in relation to the employee's relevant payments during the tax year for which the assessment is made, adjusted by <coughs> paragraph 3. Then could I invite you, my lady and my lords, to reread to, your, re -read to yourselves the rest of this regulation. I'm then going to make a number of submissions about it. So three, all the way through to seven.
I'm going to explain. It took, doesn't matter, it took a while to work out, but it did take me a while to work out how this works in stages. The first stage is that a discovery assessment is made. A total amount of tax will be payable under that assessment. That's stating the obvious. There are then two possibilities at this stage. Um, can I say it quickly and then say it slower for your note? The first situation is that the officer making the assessment has by this stage already found out that the tax which should have been deducted or accounted for by the employer was not. In, in that eventuality, he can either make a direction under Reg 72 or 81, or not make a direction. If he does make a direction, the amount which should have been deducted but was not, or any amount which should have been accounted for but was not, is not added to letter B in the first place. So you don't get the credit. The credit does not arise in the first place, if, if a direction is made. Do you mean, when you say in the first place, do you mean when the discovery assessment is made? N no. After the discovery assessment Well, he could make a direction before the discovery assessment yes. or simultaneously with the discovery assessment. I'm going to come on to the next situation where he makes it after yes. the discovery assessment. For present purposes, simultaneously or just before, um, if he makes the direction at the time of or before the discovery assessment, yeah. what that means is that you do not add into capital letter B at Reg 1882 the additional sum specified in Regulation 1883A1 and 2. It's the A1 and 2 that is the so-called credit. I mean, the word credit. I'm afraid, has bedeviled this case because it's not used in that regulation. It's a mathematical addition. But where do you get what, on, on what basis do you say three doesn't apply? Okay, look at four. No direction tax oh, is to be so. included in calculating the amount of tax referred to in paragraph 3A. <clears throat> so that's what happens if the officer makes a direction. The credit doesn't arise in the first place because of the mandatory effect of sub 4. The second situation <coughs> is that the officer decides not to make a direction for some reason. In that event, the credit will arise. I say credit, the so-called credit. The, the mathematical addition entailed in Regulation 1883A Roman 1 and 2 will happen. You add to B the amount, the tax, which the employer was liable to deduct but failed to or was liable to account for but failed to. That is what this case is all about. B is an amount you deduct from A. So if you add to B, you're giving a credit, aren't you? Ex yes. I'm the, uh, the only reason not I'm... Sure why the credit's a problem. Well, maybe it isn't. It's just, it's just... Yeah, maybe it's not, my lord. But, but, but B does not just include the um, kind of credit that Mr. Mullen is talking about, because <coughs> B includes, as we see from the definition of B, the total net, tu net, net tax deduction. That's actual deduction. So the, the, the main credit is actually the tax that has been deducted. So the PAYE deducted on the small element of salary pay will come would be a <coughs> Would be B without reference to three. Yes, precisely so, my lady. I hadn't actually thought of it in that way, but my lady is right.
But that deals with the situation in which either a direction is or is not made before or at the time of the discovery assessment. And that's covered by one, two, three, and four. What happens then if a direction is made after the discovery assessment is made? That's covered by five. And that caters for the possibility of the officer finding out after the discovery assessment has been made that an amount of tax which he had previously understood had been deducted or accounted for was not after all deducted or accounted for. And he then has two options. The first is he can make a direction under regulation 1885 and the effect will be that any credit for an amount which should have been deducted and accounted for and was not is removed. It has a, to, to use perhaps um, unhelpful language, it's a retrospective curing of the position as he previously believed it to be at the time of making the discovery assessment. And again, the credit, which had arisen by then, B and B3, will be removed. The second possibility is that he decides not to make a direction on all the facts, in which case the credit remains and the collection obligation stays with the employer. And I've tried to explain that in stages, but the bottom line is that all of that is consistent with the directions not altering the amount of tax payable under the discovery assessment itself, but only with removing the amount of credit that in the light of the direction should not have been included or is not included in the notice of assessment or in the assessment in the first place. So all of that machinery just shows that we are talking about Whitney stage three, not Whitney stage two. Well, that's apparent from the definition at the bottom, isn't it? That's why, I, and, and, and it's a definition that Mr. Mullen did not read out to you and is very important. So what, what's, the, what's the difference between the assessment and the notice of assessment? A, um, a notice of assessment, my lady. Can I have one of those? Okay. A, a notice of assessment has to be given under Section 30, Capital A of the Taxes Management Act. Once, once, once the, yes. the assessment has been made. made and... It's particularly subsection 30 A capital, sorry, subsection 30 capital A3. So, that, so a notice of assessment is is where there isn't a self-assessment. Yes. Yeah. So when you've got a closure notice assessment or a discovery assessment, would you expect to see a notice of assessment? Well, if you've got a discovery they, they assessment, if you've got a discovery assessment. assessment, you'd expect to see a notice of assessment. I can't remember what the notification requirements are when the revenue issues a closure notice amending your self-assessment, but I suspect it there's something... It takes effect as a, an amendment to the self-assessment. Yes, there's a lot so of litigation about whether assessment. it's an assessment or not. It's a different species of yeah. decision. 28. 28A. Yes. 
yes, Miss Lemos rightly reminds me that the matter is dealt with in Section 28A itself, which is at page 45 of the legislation bundle. <coughs> yeah, and, and Miss Narton tells me correctly that it's in 28A sub 2. Are you looking for the section? No, 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 I've got it. I, I thought there was something that said uh, uh, that it t takes effect as an amendment to the self-assessment. Mm. Uh, I think it's, it, is it in 9C? It's or either, hold on. 9. It doesn't matter. We'll find it. Can I come back to that if yes. I need to? Yes. Um, ask, may I ask, things that you're handing in, in paper, will you provide them electronically? Yes, of well? course. And I'm sorry, I, I, I asked myself the question last night, where is the requirement to serve a notice of assessment, which is why I, we've only brought this now. Um, but we'll certainly provide electronic copies. Can, can I... Um, can I now go to Section 8 TMA and to address Mr. Mullen's submission that you can somehow tell that the credit affects Whitney Stage 2 assessment by reason of Section 8.5. We just start, please, with section 81AA sub B. For the purposes of section subsection 1 above, the amount payable by a person by way of income tax is the difference between the amount in which he is chargeable and the aggregate amount of any income tax deducted at source. And we fully accept, and this makes sense, that that includes all amounts of income tax that were deducted at source. That makes complete sense. So when you're talking about amounts that were in fact deducted at source, you take that into account in section 8, 1A, A, B. Now, Mr. Mullen says you go further than that and you also take into account the amounts that should have been deducted at source but were not. And, and he, that's because of subsection 5. Yes, but he's wrong. So in this section, in sections 8A, 9 and 12A, A, any reference to income tax deducted at source is a reference to income tax deducted, yes, or treated as deducted from any income or treated as paid on any income. But that is not a reference, as I'm going to show you, to regs 185 and 188. We know it's not 185, because we're told 185 doesn't apply for this. What then, we ask rhetorically, is this talking about? And there are several examples, because there are several <coughs> examples of um, ways in which tax is, in broad terms, accounted for, where you treat it as deducted, even though it's not a deduction. And the first example is in the bundle in section 710, sub 6 sub B of ITPA, C legislation bundle, page 243. It's perhaps the most obvious example. This is back in the world of notional payments. I'm sorry, which page? 243. So 
So this is 710 sub 6, any amount which an employer deducts, as mentioned in subsection 1, or for which an employer accounts in subsection 4, is to be treated as an amount of tax at the time when the notional payment is made is deducted. So if you actually deduct, or even if you actually account, by you I mean the employer, that takes effect to reduce the amount payable under subsection 8.5 of the TMA. But what that does not say is you include in the amount treated as deducted amounts which should have been but were not deducted. So you're, you're saying 710 is an example yes. of a situation where treated as... Deducted, uh, deducted mean, means, means something other than deducted. It yes. means accounted. Yes. It includes accounted. But is it limited to that? Well, there's a, there's a, there's a couple of other examples. I mean, there may be lots, but we found this one and two others. The two others we gave to the upper tribunal, which it accepted as explaining this, are referred to in the upper tribunal's judgment at paragraph 106, just so you can see it. They are, well, let me show you them in the... Um, in their original form rather than in the way they're referred to in the upper tribunal judgment. The first is section 414 of ITOIA at additional authorities bundle tab 3 page 21 sorry page 21 Additional authorities bundle. Oh, sorry. So this is income tax treated as paid. A person liable to tax under this chapter, and this chapter is about tax on dividends from UK companies, is treated as having paid income tax at the dividend ordinary rate on the income tax charged, etc. So that's one example of income tax treated as having been paid. Another example over the um, next page, page 22, Itoya section 530, an individual or trustee who is liable for tax on an amount under this chapter, this is all to do with life insurance contracts, are treated as having paid income tax at the basic rate. So going back to section 8, I've given you an example of amounts that are treated as deducted when in fact they're accounted for. And these are two examples of amounts treated as paid, because that's what 85 also refers to. But well, why, why is it limited to those examples? Well, there may, there, given? My lady, there, there may be others, but the... What's the answer to Mr Mullins' point? that includes the credit? Well, the answer in Regulation 185 is that 185 is expressly and limited to 59A and B. And the answer in relation to 188 is that, as the upper tribunal held and I've shown you by looking at the substance of it, is um, functionally similar to 185 and is uh, expressly distinguishes between the amount payable under the assessment and, and the Whitney Stage 3 amount. So there is no basis for considering that Section 8.5 includes either 185 or 183 notional credit for amounts that should have been deducted or accounted for but were not.
Yes, and Ms. Lemos rightly points out that there's nothing in 188 that refers to So my, my, my lady, my lords, those are our principal submissions on how the legislation is to be construed, which we say offers the complete answer to the jurisdiction argument. Can I now finally deal with <coughs> the cases and the submissions Mr. Mullen makes about why a different purposive construction should be arrived at? His first point is the kind of policy point that his approach must be right because Parliament can't have intended to set up a system where jurisdiction to decide different tax-related questions all <coughs> falls to be decided in different tribunals or courts. Well, with respect, that aspirational statement does not reflect the reality of the current legislation. First, as a general matter, it's obvious that um, uh, tax legislation, both procedural and substantive, is often complex. I mean, I, I, by, the reason I'm saying it's often complex is that Mr. Mullen says it should be easy for the ordinary taxpayer to understand what he's got to do. Well, yes. that would be nice. <laughs> um, but, it, but, it, but it isn't. Uh, and the fact that it isn't is not a, is not a uh, carte blanche for... <coughs> the rewriting of what the legislation says. Um, it's also clear that some aspects of tax <coughs> disputes are allocated to tax tribunal, and some can only be resolved by a claim for judicial review, which of course nowadays can be heard either in the administrative court or following transfer under the relevant provisions of the TCEA and the CPR in the specialist upper tribunal. And some disputes are properly characterized as relating to the enforcement of tax debts and are lit litigable in the relevant court, the county court or the high court. Third, there will, of course, sometimes be questions about whether in enforcement proceedings the taxpayer is entitled to raise a Wandsworth and Winder type public law defense. And that will all depend upon the legislation and the, the scheme in question. And in support of that proposition, can we go back to an authority that Mr. Mullen mentioned? It's my lady's judgment in the case of Beadle, Authorities Bundle, tab 47. As my lady may recall, Beadle concerned a challenge to a penalty or non-payment of a PPN, a partner payment notice, which is um, the LLP equivalent of an accelerated payment notice in the Finance Act 2014. And the court held, this court held, that the FTT had no jurisdiction on a penalty appeal to consider the validity of the underlying EPN. And the critical passage is in My Lady's Judgment at page 1433 of the bundle, <coughs> paragraph 44. But I invite the court to read paragraph 44 and highlight the last sentence, which is the principle I rely upon. So whether a public law challenge can or cannot be brought at any, in any particular context depends on the statutory regime at play. It does not 
amount to a proposition that everything must be capable of being challenged in the FTT. Um, can I now finally deal with the um, quartet of cases that Mr. Mullen relied upon in support of his general broad proposition? Essentially, he says, well, it's jolly important for the taxpayer to know exactly how much he's got to pay. And ipso facto, um, the Reg 80, 185 and 188 credit issue must be capable of being a part of the assessment process so that the employee knows how much he's got to pay. The starting point is the Aluwalia case. That's the case my learned friend first took you to. Authorities bundle tab 15. McCulloch and Aluwalia McCulloch being the inspector. I'm just going to explain briefly why the, well, what the case was about. The case concerned a situation in which the taxpayer had sent along his accountant to represent him at an appeal against an assessment before the general commissioner. And the accountant had agreed the relevant figure with the officer, and the general commissioners had decided the appeal in the amount agreed. <laughs> Mr. Aluwalia, then, when it came to pay up in the enforcement proceedings, essentially argued, well, my accountant did not have authority to agree that amount on my behalf, and the decision is therefore vitiated. The revenue sought to enforce the debt in the county court and issued a certificate under subsection 1 of section 70 of TMA, which I'll come to. Mr. Mullen um, relies upon paragraphs 46 and the opening sentence <coughs> of paragraph 47, where Lord Justice Jonathan Parker said, I accept Miss Addy's submission that the statutory machinery for appeal against a notice of assessment is exclusive machinery. Just pausing there. That doesn't help, Mr. Mullen, because that begs the question, what is in the notice of assessment? Next, in the second place, I also agree with Miss Addy that the district judge was bound by the figures in the Section 70 certificates. It's not necessary in the instant case to address what's sufficient. But, but the Section 70 certificates are an evidential presumption they're nothing to do with the question with which we are now concerned, namely what is or is not in the assessment or the notice of assessment. Um, as I mentioned, and as Mr. Mullen fairly pointed out, section 70 sub 1 has been Repeal. I don't think he took you to, he mentioned, but he didn't take you to the section which has replaced it. That's in the additional authorities bundle at tab four. Which is section 25 capital A of the CRCA 2005 heading certificates of debt a certificate of an officer of revenue and customs that to the best of that officer's knowledge and belief a relevant sum has not been paid is sufficient evidence that the sum mentioned in the certificate is unpaid sub 4 subsection 1 has any effect has effect subject to any provision treating the certificate as conclusive evidence but these are all evidential provisions. But the idea that either section 70 sub 1, when it was still on the statute books, or section 25 capital A certificates, um, present any substantive obstacle to arguing whatever legal point is necessary, is misplaced and is irrelevant to the question now before the court. So that is Aluwalia, 
Um, as for the cases of Hallamshire Archer and MXC Bunley, um, they are all irrelevant for similar reasons. Can I just show you what the upper tribunal said about them before I go to them in turn? That is to be found in upper tribunal judgment paragraphs um, 59 to 61, core bundle page. Well, we can see the discussion of them starting at page 194. Bundle 194, tab 11. So you can see Hallamshire discussed at 55 to 56, Archer discussed at 57 to 58, and then um, importantly, 59. We agree Hallamshire and Archer are established. Where the revenue makes an assessment, including an amends a self assessment, the assessment <coughs> has to set out an amount of tax payable. However, that proposition must be viewed in the context of the facts and issues raised in those cases. Properly understood, <coughs> both cases were about situations where further work needed to be done to ascertain an amount of tax payable, i.e., under the assessment. The underlying issue was who should do that work. Where assessments were made by the revenue, or by parity of reasoning, self assessments were amended by the revenue I under a closure notice. The judgment was that it was the revenue who should do that work. More fundamentally, the cases don't deal with the question of what precisely the amount of tax payable should be comprised of in any particular case. In particular, they don't deal with the question of whether that amount should reflect any credit for PAYE that ought to have been deducted, but which was not, or for that matter, payments made on account. That question can only be answered by reference to considering the scope of 31 TNA which gives rise to the FDP's jurisdiction, as informed by the return and self-assessment provisions in sections 8 and 9 TMA. With respect, we agree with all of that. Um, paragraph 60, the appellant solicitors also drew our attention in the letter to the Court of Appeal decision in MXC Dunlin. And it, in a nutshell, what they then say is, that's irrelevant, it's about the regime for assessments under a different statutory framework altogether, the um, framework relating to petroleum revenue tax under the Oil Taxation Act. And so they conclude at paragraph 61, we therefore reject Mr. Mullen's primary argument that by virtue of a principle that the <coughs> assessment should make clear the amount, the applicability of a PAYE credit for amounts that ought to have been deducted but were not deducted is encompassed within an appeal. Well, that they are correct. Um, and all I want to do is just um, briefly say a few words about the trio of cases of Hallamshire, Archer, and Dunley. Well, I've, co I've covered everything I want to say about Dunley. It was a completely different statutory regime. Um, just to remind the court, and you probably don't even need to turn it up, in Hallamshire, the, the extreme argument advanced by the revenue and rejected was that there was no requirement to state any figures at all in the notice of assessment. Of course, that, that was even more striking in the days when Hallamshire was decided, which was before self-assessment. That's the Hallamshire case. The Archer case, the point in Archer, as my lady and my lords may recall, was that the revenue had amended the taxpayer's self-assessment by a closure notice, denying him the loss relief that he had sought, but then failed to say what the increased amount of tax was he had to pay under the assessment itself. And they then purported to correct that by tweaking the online version of the assessment uh, um, and then sending him a letter. <coughs> and the court held that the original closure notice amendment was not valid because it didn't state the figure, but, that it, uh, 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 but, but the appeal was refused because of the curative effect of section 114 TMA. It didn't strictly comply with the section 28 obligation exactly to so. amend the, the assessment in accordance with your 
Exactly so. And my Lord, Lord Justice Henderson, in the case of Amrolia, yeah. identified the ratio of um, uh, Archer, uh, C. Amrolia, tab 46 of Authorities Bundle. Let's just turn that up. Authorities Bundle, tab 46. Paragraph 46 at page 1412. So one, four, one, 1412. Weekly Law Reports, page 4073. Bundle reference. Yeah, but bundle reference 1412. So this is the judgment of my, my Lord Lord Justice Henderson, paragraph 46. Left just above letter F. Archer is authority for the proposition that a closure notice issued on completion of an inquiry into a personal return under 28A must amend the taxpayer self assessment so as to state the precise amount of tax which is said to be payable. I interpolate under the assessment. It says nothing about the present question. There was no, no consideration of the effect of 59A and B. Um, subject to any questions from my lady and my lords, those are our submissions on jurisdiction. Thank you very much. Mr. Thank you. I now hand over to my learned friend, Miss Nathan. this fits in generally with your uh, case on this appeal? Absolutely, and that's one of the things that I was going to get right. to as, as one of my submissions, but I'm very happy to take it right now. Um, the, the, uh, the way the transfer of assets provisions fit is that they are, in and of themselves, generally a freestanding um, a head of charge, an independent head of charge. And I'll show you how they are engaged um, when I get to submission one. In, on the facts of this case, however, we maintain that because the relevant transfer of assets is the employment contract, that the transfer of assets provisions take priority. Because by virtue of the transfer of assets, and I'll explain this as I go along, the power to enjoy uh, the, the creation of the rights, um, uh, the creation of the rights is the transfer of assets for these purposes. That's IRC and Mr. Hoey. Um, that enables the services of Mr. Hoey to be provided to the end client through the chain of intermediaries and agencies, by virtue of which income arises to the person abroad. Because of the employment contract, Mr. Hoey has the ability, and I'll show you why the ability is enough, to enjoy that income, because he is able to receive the salary. But is that so even before the income has arisen to the employer abroad? It arises, uh, we would say, from the moment he starts serv providing services. That can't be right. Income can only arise once you've had a computation of the employer's income at the um, end of an appropriate period. That really. comes to the question of computation of the income of the person abroad. But no, in no, income, no income arises to a trader until you get to that stage, does it? 
I mean, all that more Wilberforce force made that very clear in Chetwood. We'll come um, to this. It's a question of timing, my lord. And oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And what we say is that the way that the transfer of assets provisions are set out, yes, of course, it's right that a trader has to uh, compute their profit in order to determine whether the measure of that income. Yeah, I'm sorry. For profit, the only income in question is those profits. Absolutely right, my lord. Um, nobody's denying that. Uh, the, the point then is why is it we say that they take priority why over? That? Yes. And we say they take priority over the. Um, because, uh, because uh, over the ITPA provisions, because ITPA requires receipts by Mr. Hoey. Um, and the redirection provisions may take effect, but they only take effect after the income arises. I no, it, after it doesn't arise to the employer, at least because there, no one is arose to the employer, because we've had no tax computations, we haven't seen profit and loss account, the evidence didn't go into it. Did you? Uh, my Lord, if I may. Develop that yes. in due course, course. I'm sure you will. But, yes. but I'm, at the moment, I'm struggling with the idea that somehow the transfer of assets abroad is stage one in the analysis, rather than a reserve weapon which the revenue can use in exceptional cases, whereas the perfectly straightforward ranger's analysis doesn't get them home. And it just seems topsy turvy that we should have to go into these incredibly complicated and difficult provisions, which date back to 1936, in order to, you say, as the first sort of line of attack. I'm not saying in every case of this nature the revenue are going to run transfer of assets arguments in parallel with a with a simple claim based on receipt of emoluments. My lord, I don't know about every case. What it's I can say is it depends very much on the type of transfer of assets in order to determine yeah. which provisions take priority. And what we would say is in uh, that we've seen it in Boyle, we've seen it in this case, we've seen it in another which settled the uh, Mm. Um, case which came to the doors of the court and was settled by the tax act on the morning of the hearing when they heard our yeah. submission. So these, these, these provisions are being deployed in the context of these particular types of schemes where um, the employment arrangement is being used or uh, sorry, in order to provide benefits yeah. and receipts in a way that seeks to escape the total effect of ITPA or uh, uh, in respect to some part or all of the payments that it receives. But we say that you're absolutely right, my lord. When it comes to the computation of profits, of course, the profits arise uh, in a particular um, year. But we say that they still, nevertheless, those profits arise at a point earlier than the receipt by the taxpayer. We just don't know, do we? I mean, why should we assume that? And are, and are you saying these are cumulative charges? And if not, why not? And I know double, because it's not the same income being taxed. It's um, a different. It's a, yeah, it's absolutely a, as you right. say, it's freestanding. So if revenue is right, you have double taxation. Well, we would say we don't. Mind. Why not? We would say we don't have double taxation because of Section 743 plus 1. I can take you to that now if you wish. Um, we would also say that because 743 plus 1, uh, 743 plus 4 uh, is, uh, specifically is the one that we would apply, which, is, which says that where you have a charge under 720 or 721 and you subsequently receive the income, you do not get charged again on that. Now, of course, if the question is, is it that income? And we, because the income is the it's fee not, income, one would say, not, arriving to It's not that income. I mean, the income is, uh, surely, it's a, it's a separate head of charge, the income which you have power to enjoy, which is the trading income of the employer, on the one hand. And on the other hand, you have the ranger's charge on the, on the emoluments, or whatever they're called, <laughs> employment income. Uh, well, it, the, the measure, my, sorry, forgive me, my lord, I yeah. think the point is this, that we have the fee income that's taken into the person of reward. Yeah. That is the amount that is attributed to the trader. But, but the legislation itself, for, for example, in section 746 itself, treats, uh, gives the trader the ability to set off against that, the reliefs he would have had, had he received that income himself. So the legislation already indicates that it's seeking to uh, treat the income he receives as the income that is received by the offshore employer, by the offshore person. Because the legislation itself is seeking to ameliorate that distinction of change of, uh, of source. So we would say that, yes, of course you're right, technically it is a separate source, but the le legislation itself is seeking to remove double charges under 743 plus 4 upon receipt, uh, sorry, upon, uh, upon the person who subsequently receives uh, the income upon which a charge has already arisen under 721. But, but he doesn't receive that income. 
Now, see, he doesn't receive a slice of the profits of the employer. He just receives the trading receipt, which was passed on straight away to the EPT. Well, the, and that's where we say, my lord, that the indication of 746, which seeks to treat the, uh, it seeks to give the employee or the person to whom the transfer, or let's call them that, because that's the relevant mm. uh, language, the transferor is treated as being the person receiving the income of the person abroad, uh, and, uh, as if it were his income, and is therefore entitled to set against it the release and allowance that he was given. And we say that's a very strong indication that Parliament recognises that there is this disparity between what comes into the person abroad and what is uh, and uh, the amount that is attributed to the uh, to the uh, transferor, and seeks to ameliorate that position by treating it <coughs> as something in respect of which you can get allowance. I'm afraid you will need to explain that a bit more, a bit more fully later on. I, I'm sorry, I'm firing no, questions I, at you right at the start, but I mean, <laughs> I am troubled at the prospect, just in general terms, that we should end up in a where you, in every case of this nature, you have a potentially parallel um, inquiries, which will in, involve taxpayers and their advisors and the courts and tribunals, and an immense amount of work if we have to go into all the complications of transfer of assets abroad in relation to a case where all the heavy lifting has been done by the Supreme Court in Rangers. And you have a completely straightforward charge to tax, which, in, on the face of it, will apply to, and I know Mr. Mullen has arguments which we have to consider, which might lead to the conclusion in this particular case that the taxpayer isn't caught. But in principle, surely that charge is going to be the, the, the simple and obvious way of dealing with these cases. My lord, I, I take your indication. Um, I, uh what we would say, however, is that these provisions apply on the face. Well, OK, I'm obviously, of course, you're completely entitled, your clients are, to, to use all your armaments they have in their, in Absolutely, their, my lord. In their arsenal. But, but one needs a sense of proportion as well. <laughs> my, my lord, um, it, it may be that in, uh, that in lots of cases where payments are made to a contractor, the transfer of assets may not be used. But where it is used, we say, when it comes to an employment contract yeah. and the uh, and the uh, the person abroad is carrying on the trade, um, the, the, the the quantum of profits are attributed to the person uh, to the uh, transferor, and that we say happens at an earlier <coughs> stage than the receipt, uh, i.e., the, the point at which ITPA would bite in relation to the employee, because that would that would bite at the point at which he receives his income or is entitled to receive that. Well, surely ITPA charge bites them the following ranges at the stage when the when the payment is made into the EBT. I mean that is the payment from which PAYE should which the we say, be deducted. Thank you, my lord. That, that makes my point. Which we say falls after the point at which no. the income is received. It doesn't by the offshore the, employer. Because the payment into the EBT is just the payment which the offshore employer makes in the course of its trade. But whether it was a profit at that stage, we haven't a clue until we know what the Profit and loss accounts at Lord, the end of an appropriate period. Um, There's been um, no, in, no investigation of that issue at all, as far as I can see. Uh, you're absolutely right. In this case, um, the, the tribunal, the FTC, well, did not. this case is the one we're concerned with. Absolutely. In this case, the tribunal did not address its mind as to whether or not it was, in fact, yeah, a miserable deduction. It hadn't been they, signaled in your grounds or anything. Um, which, sorry, my sorry, oh, well, sorry, I mean, I'm, I'm, this is I'm now your, your point about the wholly and exclusive. <laughs> That's another issue. But, but, Okay, I take that back. I think that was a, a bad point I was making. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, well, I, I, I'm grateful for all the indications, my lord. Uh, perhaps if I could well, I'm sorry, I've been firing salvos at you, but you know, you'll gather I'm not altogether happy with this part. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I've gathered that, my lord. Um, and it's for me to try and persuade As you. As soon as you and I'll listen patiently to your Thank you, that's, that's most kind. I think the, what I would like to do, if I might, is just to go back and tell you the order in which I'd like to take things. And yep. um, obviously, I shall be at your disposal to answer any further. Well, we, we flagged up the concerns the court Absolutely. has, and my lord has flagged those up very clearly for you. <laughs> Absolutely, my lord. Um, so we've got, um, so what I was proposing to do is to set out how the transfer of assets provisions are actually engaged here, in the circumstances of this case. We then proposed to take you through the case law on wholly and exclusively, and how wholly and exclusively has a role to play. In particular, we want to uh, make clear how sensitive the inquiry is when it comes to holding exclusively. The, the inquiry
inquiry into the facts into the minds of the player. The third um, is uh, it's said that we really didn't, we don't have a right to raise the Holy Institute the argument at all. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll deal with that third, which is the, as I call it, the feeling point. Fourth, I'll then uh, seek to show you how the appellant put his case before the F FTC and what caused him to not to lead evidence. Because um, as, as far as we could ascertain, uh, the concession that was made that rains was applied, and therefore these were earnings, we, uh, it appears from his submissions, and certainly the way in which the, uh, the and I'll take you through how he put it below, that remuneration was sufficient to garner the protection of holy exclusively um, deduction. And we said that that isn't right um, as a matter of law. And then I'd, I'd like to take you FTT's fact findings of fact on no notice exclusively based on the evidence that was before them. So this may require a little bit of foraying into um, some of the um, matters that we pointed out in our reply uh, on the cross appeal. And then in relation to submission uh, and submission six, <coughs> I should then like to go through the UT decision and uh, identify the errors of law there again in relation to. Those are completely, as it were, um, those are all limited to the holy exclusively issue. My Lord's concerns are much more about why are we here looking at greater transparency at all uh, as a matter of priority. Well, there's that preliminary issue, but also, I can also signal now, when we get to holy and exclusively, I'm by no means happy about that, but of course that's what you're going to be addressing us about. At some My Lord, length, I suspect. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, we are here to make sure that we, uh, we debate these issues uh, yes. thoroughly yes. Uh, so that we can have a, a very clear and the way that deductions ought to be, to be made. Yes. Um, so, uh, once I have done all the polling exclusively, <coughs> I should then move on to the EU law defence. Um, and our, our principal submissions are break down into four sections. The first is that um, we say that there's no movement of capital here at all. What we have is workers' rights being exercised in relation to a third country who can't rely on EU law defence. The second is that if if we're, uh, you're not with us on that, and um, you, you hold that there is a movement of capital, we say that the predominant freedom is not capital; it's in fact um, uh, workers. Again, the territorial limitation applies. Um, if you're against us on that and you hold that free movement of capital is in fact predominant, then we say that the transfer balance provisions are proportionate. And if you hold, uh, and in order to address the concern that if they are not proportionate, can they be conformingly construed? And if they can't be conformingly construed, what follows? Our primary position, of course, is that uh, we don't need to concern ourselves with the EU law defence because it's workers that's engaged, not free movement of capital. So, in relation to the first section, So, if I could just invite you to go to the legislation bundle. Um, that's where section 2020 is gone out. That's um, so tab 8A, rather than the report.
provides that income is treated as arriving for such an individual, as is mentioned in 720 sub 1, in a tax year for income tax purposes if conditions A and B are met. Condition A is that the individual has the power in the tax year to, uh, to enjoy income as a person abroad as a result of a relevant transfer, one or more associated operations or a combination. Um, if I could, uh, and B is that the income would be chargeable received by the individual. So there are concepts there that need to be, to be clarified. Uh, the first is relevant transfer. And the relevant transfer is defined in section 716. So if you go back a couple of uh, well, a few pages to page 449 in the bundle. So a relevant transfer um, is a, um, a transfer is a relevant transfer <coughs> if it is a transfer of assets uh, and as a result of the transfer, one or more associated operations, uh, or the transfer and one or more associated oper operations, income becomes payable to a person abroad. So a relevant transfer is something that gives rise to the income of the person abroad. And that something is a transfer with one or more associated operations or a transfer. And would you accept that that condition won't be satisfied unless and until you have income, in the true sense of that word, becoming payable to the person abroad? Um, the, we would say, my lord, that the income, i.e. the measure of profit, is a computational matter. The income itself arises from the yeah. person abroad. The charge to income, I'm sorry, the charge the tax on the, the income of a trade is a charge on the profits. I mean, that is the income. Um, my lord, I, uh, right? I, I don't disagree with, uh, with that proposition at all. Of course, for a trader, Chadwick makes it absolutely clear, yeah. as does Lucilla before it. Well, exactly. That I mean, that, that's, so that's why one has to. You can't talk about income arising for the foreign employers that we're talking about until you have a computation of their trading income, their pro trading profit, rather. My lord, the, what we would say is that the income that arises uh, is, uh, is the, the computation of profit is a computational um, activity, i.e., the receipts happen, uh, the expenditure happens. Yes. You then arrive at the result. But it's only when you've done that you have any taxable income at all. In what, we would of the say, uh, what we would say, what we would say, it is when you have that that it becomes attributable to the person. But the income of the person abroad here, we would say, is income arising, i.e., the income. We would say the gross receipts. That's a receipt. That's not income. Well, we would say that the income here arises um, and is then subject to deduction to arrive at the amount. Well, absolutely, but that's the that's the computation, and the computation will give rise either to a profit or to a loss. And of course, trade doesn't have to be carried on. Well, in this profit year, for instance, um, uh, so the, the the operation that would happen here mm. um, is that you have um, the fee income arising, you have the payment to the EDT, you have the loans arising, um, uh, the loans being made to the employee, and the yeah. and the those all happen. Um, at the same time, so we would say that the uh, that uh, forgive me. So when arriving at the amount of the profits, we know what the income is that has been uh, the, the fee received. We know what the expenditure is. We know that the profits um, what the profits are. But we don't because we, I mean we know these arrangements apply to hundreds of different people, and the profits of the Benfolds or whoever it is, I mean, will depend on a computation. <coughs> Based on, on, I have no idea what basis. I mean, it simply hasn't been investigated. But you, you can't, it seems to me, assume that every single receipt immediately becomes income um, in the hands of the of the employer. Because uh, we're dealing with trading income. We're not dealing with pure profit income, to use an old-fashioned expression, like dividends or interest. So, my lord, what I would say is this, that um, the, the indication uh, when we were looking at the FTT uh, and trying to work out exactly how yeah. these arrangements work, made it absolutely clear that there were no sub-trusts. They made it, um, uh, that was, I think, the evidence of Mr. Parr, and I'm sure somebody will give me the well, relevant facts. But that's, that's something about the EBT, so exactly. it's nothing to do with the profits of the employer. <coughs> the, but, my lord, one of the other points that was put to Mr. Parr was, what, uh, how do you work out Mr. Hoey's services giving rise to fees are then received by Mr. Hoey? rather than just thrown into a pot and then at some mm. aliquot part paid to him. And the answer to that was not at all clear, but they said that all of his income was paid to him. That 
was the curveball. So there was some way of segregating the receipts, but we weren't able to get to the bottom of that. No, in Vegas, it's an arithmetical calculation with the sums being paid out of a kind of pool. But this, anyway, that's, that's all about what happens in the EBT. That well, doesn't help you in computing the profits and therefore the income of the employer, does it? And it's the employer's thing. income, which is a tribute, which, has, which is a subject of taxation, or rather, you know, which is the measure of the tax, charge of the tax. Sorry. Yes. The, the, the point I was making is, I think Mr. Parr is um, is the uh, is a director of, or a trustee of Hamilton Trust, which is not the EBT. Hamilton Trust was, in fact, the second of the two employers in yes. terms of it. And it was in that context that he was being asked these questions. Yeah. As it happens, I think he was also involved um, in the EBT, uh, where, uh, in effect, his answers were that the enforcer, which was the Hamilton Foundation, based somewhere in Panama, Yes. Um, would um, recommend what payments were to be made to which employee and when. And uh, thorough questioning, and you have this all in the transcripts from the Anthony Sunday, thorough questioning um, was that uh, we were unable to arrive at how the enforcer would know how much to recommend should be paid over from the employer to the EBT, from the EBT to Mr. Hoey or any other person uh, using it. So it isn't clear, my lord, um, that all of it went into a big pot nor is it clear that it didn't. So what we are, uh, our working hypothesis is, given that Mr. Hoey uh, expected to receive the entirety of his fee-generated income, less the, uh, the amount in respect of which a small amount had been taxed, um, there was some look-through, some way of being able to trace through his funds. So where, where that is the case, you say, it is clear <coughs> what would be his, the, the fee generated by him, the expenditure uh, incurred by the uh, employer in paying the money over to the EBT, which we maintain a deductible expenditure, but nonetheless it's, um, it's traceable, and then that comes out as reported loan payment. So it is possible to say at any given point what the profits are of that entity, even if one doesn't, for, for accountancy purposes, say, know what the actual profits are for, for, uh, for the purposes of filling in company returns and the like. Because that requires a, uh, an audit, perhaps, to be undertaken. But you can tell what the income less, uh, less expenses are. That seems to me you're confusing his income and the, the income employers. generated from, by the employer. Is the income in 7161B the income of the employer? It's payable. Uh, income becomes payable to a person. But it's the income of the employer that's attributed yes. to yeah. Mr. Hoey. Yes. So the income is the profit. Yes. That's why we're arguing yes. here about yes. whether or not you deduct his income from the income of the employer. Um, I, I didn't get the point about deducting his income from the income. Well, the question is whether or not it, whether or not the sums paid into the trust are wholly and exclusively. Um, uh, so as to be deductible when calculating what the income is. I'm sorry, um, may I just ask for... The, the, the money paid into the EBT by the employer is the money that reflects his remuneration. And the question is whether that is wholly and exclusively incurred for the purposes of the employer's trade. So the employer's income must be a the, uh, so the, the income in 716 is the employer's income yes, and only the profit is, is, is what is referred to there rather than the, the gross sums yes, my lady, not that, explaining mm, it very well. That goes from, that goes from <laughs> yes, in order to work out what the profit is, I mean in accordance with normal principles, you have to have a, an appropriate period and a computation of profits based on generally accepted accounting principles, which will involve setting, well, first you look at the receipts, then you look at the allowable deductions, wholly and exclusively incurred. Um, and then you, you end up with a balance, and it's only that balance, if positive, which is income. Yes. The us, I mean, the payments in are just receipts, they're trading receipts, and that is not income in the context of a trader. 
I think it really, my lord, it turns uh, it turns out to be um, it turns out to be uh, a matter of timing more than it does uh, mm. reality, uh, does it not, my lord, my lady? Well, no, because actually, until you actually have a computation, a proper computation of profits for an appropriate period, you simply do not have any trading income at all. If you're a trader, the income only arises at the stage when you have done that computation. I mean, Lord Wilberforce says that somewhere in the chapter. Uh, absolutely, madam. Uh, and that's not being doubted. The question is, at what point does one determine what the profits are? Well, at the end of an appropriate period, and that's no evidence has been adduced on that prop topic, so we know absolutely nothing about <coughs> it. It's a pure guesswork as to what the profits of the employer were seems to me at the moment. And it's not, a, not something that this court is in any position to form a view about. <laughs> um, well, anyway, that's the problem I have at the moment. So. No, uh, and, I'm, uh, and uh, I might, if I'm, uh, if I'm interested in it, we'll come back to that point. Of course. Uh, I mean, sorry, I'm really signaling it, so I'm going to give you every opportunity of dealing with the problem. Absolutely. As I see it, and I'm very willing to be told I've got it completely wrong. I need to understand why. Well, can I ask it, put it another way? There's going to be extensive argument about whether or not the sums paid into the EBTs were held <coughs> exclusively for the purposes of the, the business. What about other sums that were expended by the business? Sums paid to its other employees and directors and incurred in banking charges, etc., etc. What do we know about those? Um, we know very little about pretty much all of that. Um, and the point that we have made throughout is that what we are aware of is that fee income was generated elsewhere. We are aware that intermediaries charged fees, but we don't know at what level. Um, we are aware that, mis uh, that, court, that, 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 forgive me, that loans were made to, to Mr. Hoey, uh, which he didn't expect to repay, uh, of certain amounts, and that they represented amounts that he was satisfied receiving. Now, that, that suggests, we say, that there was a, a, a correlation and we'd say suggest very strongly that there was a very strong correlation between what he received and the income generated by his services provided through his employer to the entities. Uh, so the, in terms of what we know about what other disbursements there were, we don't know what bank charges there were. We don't know any of these other facts. But it's not for the want of asking. But we're not concerned with what he received when we look at income. We're concerned with the employer's income. Yes, my lady. And so, and in arriving at that employer's income, one needs to look at the fee receipt and the permissible deduction. Now, there are, you may be asking, uh, why is it that we haven't uh, sought to uh, exclude uh, the small sum paid to him as a direct salary, uh, the minimum wage amount? Why we haven't sought to include the intermediary um, fees that were, that were deducted? Those were points that were not taken in this case. Um, the, in, in terms of the intermediaries, um, I'll come back to you with the answer to that, but in terms of the uh, small payments, the, there was an essential distinction between this payment into the EBT and the payment directly into um, uh, uh, of the minimum wage to Mr. Hoey. Mm. One is that uh, PAY was in fact operated and respected it. There was no attempt to disguise it uh, as anything else other than salary. Um, it, uh, it therefore um, appeared to, to the relevant that um, to treat it as salary seemed appropriate. The payments that funneled through the EBT were just qualitatively different because there was an attempt to disguise them. The attempt being to treat them uh, as loan, even though they were not repayable or not expected to be. This is, completely, this is completely mixing up, confusing the two aspects of that we're dealing with here. Is it the PAYE aspect and the POAA aspect? And why, why does the fact that there is a a proper PAYE aspect to it have any impact at all on the TO? Um, my lord, um, uh, that's a very valid question. The, the point is, uh, why is it that we didn't um, seek to exclude the small minimum wage salary element? Um, and uh, and it's in answer to that that I'm uh, I'm seeking to to address you. Um, it is that there was seen to be a qualitative difference between the payment of the minimum wage that was uh, paid to Mr. Hoey, in respect of which he accounted to the revenue in his tax return, uh, and uh, in respect of which uh, PAYE had been operated. That seems so my, to my understanding from what you said at the beginning is that even if an offshore company um, operated a completely proper, full PAYE scheme, 
and included um, counting for um, tax on the whole of income, however um, properly of the contractor, you would still say that TOAA was applicable. My lord, it was paying because very it's a much. transfer. It's a transfer <coughs> abroad, and income arises on those assets. Given, given the, the wide definition of and transfer as creation and rights. You'd have the double taxation. You'd have well, double. my lord, in that instance, the motive defence might apply, because that is, that is what these provisions are broadly drafted. But uh, where tax avoidance is not even a purpose of the arrangements, you don't have to concern yourself with the transfer of assets provision, equally if there are genuine commercial transactions and aren't, which aren't incidentally designed to achieve uh, a tax avoidance purpose you come outside the transfer assets provisions. But the transfer assets provisions are broadly defined in order to cover the unforeseen ways in which taxpayers are able to engineer matters in order to bring themselves outside the charge to tax. Well, that rather brings me back to where we were starting, which is if you've got now a perfectly clear charge on, on the basis of the employment income provisions, why do we need to bother with transfer assets abroad? It's just an immense complication. My Lord, we are here. Well, I know um, we are. <laughs> <laughs> but one of your criticisms of the FTT is you, you say they were wrong to sort of breathe a sigh of relief and say we don't need to deal with TOAA, having decided the other issues in favour of the revenue. And uh, well, my Lord, the, the, same the transfer of assets <laughs> provisions are important, but even more important is getting the principles right for the Holy Institute. Well, and the way in which the tribunal... miles down the road. We don't get anywhere near wholly and exclusively unless we can understand why we're engaging these provisions in the first place. And once we've actually got round to a proper computation of the employer's profits. My Lord, but the, the logical consequence of what you're saying is that if taxpayers are entering into arrangements and aren't willing to come forward with evidence in relation to those arrangements, the transfer of assets provisions cannot apply because we can't compute the profits well, adequately. That... And that would be quite a far-reaching... Well, one aspect of all this is, what is when, where does the burden of proof lie on all these matters? And I know that we have an in-time assessment here, so you're on solid ground to say normally the burden is on the taxpayer to explain everything. Absolutely. But I mean, these are this is highly complex anti-avoidance legislation. Is it really right that that principle applies in its sort of unvarnished totality to this kind of? Situation? My lord, we would say uh, yes because. There's really authority on it. I'm interested. In um, uh, uh, we haven't, I don't think, got any authority on it. The point is, the legislation applies. And these circumstances okay. are ones in, uh, on the face of it. Um, there is a transfer of assets. There is income, i.e. profits, arising to a person abroad. The question, I suppose, is really, what is the measure of that income, and which takes priority, the transfer of assets provisions or these other provisions, uh, any other provisions that may apply? Because, of course, there might be dividend distributions. Well, you say which takes priority. In the first question, you've got to identify income of the employer on which the legislation can bite. And to do that, because the employer is a trader, you've got to show that there are new exceptions. You've got to show that there are profits. And to ascertain profits, I mean, assuming we apply English law, which is horribly right, it's an English statute, and we don't have to look at the Isle of Man or Guernsey law, but assuming that's right, then in the normal way, you have, like I was saying, you have to have a profit <coughs> for an appropriate period drawn up in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. And that important stage just doesn't seem to be addressed anywhere in the evidence and the findings so far. And in the absence of that, you have no income on which the legislation can bite. So I mean, that's the end of it. Before you get on to anything about holy and exclusively, My which Lord, is a further there, problem. <laughs> isn't there a distinction, though, and this is, I think, the point I was making, perhaps not um, quite as articulately as, as I would have liked to, that there is a difference between, um, uh, between saying that there is no profit and saying that there is no profit as yet computed. Because there clearly is profit here. There was income being generated. You might have been making losses for all I know. Uh, well, what, <laughs> what we would say is that there, uh, mm. the, whether or not there were losses being made would depend on the extent to which there were permissible deductions and yeah. if they exceeded the amount of fee income. Yeah. We certainly know that there was fee income generated because um, because Mr. Hoey did receive sums that were paid via um, the EBT, which had been funded. So we know that there was income, i.e. in the gross receipts. You know the receipts. So let's call them you receipts. Can we call them receipts? Yes, absolutely. Yes. So let's call them uh, receipts. There yeah. was definitely receipts in the offshore employer's hands. Uh, we know that there were, um, uh, that we have figures in the, uh, in the decision, I guess, and 
proponents and Mr. Finch's evidence regarding the number of people who were engaged in this arrangement. I think one of the documents says it's about 900 people who used this arrangement. So there's quite a lot of people. So there's a lot of fee receipts. There's masses of cash flow going on there. Massive cash flow. Masses of administrative expenditure, no doubt. Well, there was absolutely no evidence of that. And that was the difficulty. It wasn't that questions weren't asked. And this brings us back to the question, my lord, which is that if you have a recalcitrant tax avoider, whether or not it is the individual or the person operating the scheme, so that the information is not made available, so that you can measure the amount of fee receipts and expenditure, so that you cannot arrive at a computed profit, does it mean that the taxpayer has, in one fell swoop, escaped the provisions of the transfer of assets? It may be said. In the real world, if the revenue want to run this kind of case, they have very extensive information gathering powers, which indeed I gather were used in these 76 boxes of documents coming from the Isle of Man, which we know nothing about. But I mean, surely the revenue have to make in practice the running, don't they, on a point like, in a case like this, where on the findings of fact made by the FPT, the employee didn't really have a clue what was going on, and certainly is not in a position himself to begin getting incredibly complicated evidence from the offshore employers and their advisors as to how their financial affairs were set up, what profit and loss accounts they had, and all the rest of it. If you want to pursue that line of inquiry, you're putting an enormous burden on taxpayers. My lord, there are a few points I'd like to make. I suppose a lot of points, rather gathered up in all that. Yes. The point is that, sorry, there are several points here. The first is, it is for the taxpayer to say and to prove that their assessment is wrong. Yes. We have assessments here. The burden of proof is on them. All they have asserted, and I'll take you to what they've said, is that because they have conceded that this was remuneration, it must therefore be deductible. And we say that that isn't right as a matter of law. They have provided absolutely no evidence to support their position that those sums are deductible. Because they depend on the income of the person abroad being nil in order to escape a tax liability on the employee. So they need this deduction in order to achieve the tax outcome that they have sought, which is that there is a payment which is subject to national minimum wage, which is subject to PAYE, and the rest of it escapes tax, whether under PAYE or otherwise. Under PAYE, the concession they have made that they are earning, they still try and get around by saying, but we don't have to pay it. Somebody else pays it. On transfer of assets, they say there was fee income, but all of it was paid out. All of it was paid out as remuneration. Therefore, it is deductible. And we say no, because when you look at the totality of the arrangement, when you look at the upper tribunal decision in Scots Atlantic, you take into account the fact that the payments that were made to the EBT were made in the context of these arrangements. So you have to ask yourself, to what extent is the fact that they were made in the context of this arrangement one of the purposes for which the payment was made? I know that's your case on wholly and exclusively, but I mean, the obvious counter to that is to say that when an employer pays the wages of his employee, that is a quintessential allowable expense. You're confusing the motive with the purpose of the expenditure. The purpose was just to ensure that Mr. Hoey ended up with the 500, whatever it was, which has gone round in this enormous circle. My lord, and the point is this, that in order to get the deduction, it must be for the purposes of the payer's trade. Yes, which was the provision of services by UK-based employees. But there were findings, my lord, that there were no profits earned by the employer. Which begs the question, in what way can it be serving the purposes of the trade? In what way are the basis of the money here? There's no requirement for a profit to be carried on, for a trade to be carried on as a profit. Well, exactly. You can have a trade without having a profit. But if you are going to ask, what is the purposes of this trade? What does it mean? We've got Strong and Woody here saying, for the purposes of earning profits is what that means. Now, if here, there was absolutely no profit to the stock, and in fact, Hamilton Trust, Mr. Parr's evidence is clear that they aimed not to earn profit, then in what way 
can this be said to be for the purposes of their trade? Well, because the purpose of their trade was to provide the services of UK-based employees to UK-based end users. And in order to do that, they had to ensure that the employee would end up getting what he contracted to provide his services for in the first place. Well, my lord, that's, that's um, what he contracted. I mean, the money had to go round in the circle, didn't it? I mean, putting it in crude and simple terms. Uh, there, there, I think if I may put it in these terms, um, nobody is saying that when it comes to an ordinary everyday arrangement where an employee does a day's work for a day's wage under an ordinary contract, that it won't be possible to satisfy the holy exclusive test. It will be very easy in those circumstances mm. to satisfy the holy exclusive test, that's what I'm just saying. But there are limits, and the point is that just because it's remuneration does not mean it's automatically deductible. It still needs to be holy exclusively, which requires you to think about what are the purposes for which the payment was made. And it, was, it must be only for the purposes of the player's trade, which we say means for the purposes of earning profit. And here they earned no profit. And you have to say, as a matter of law, then, that the FTT were not entitled on the very exiguous material they had before them to conclude that this, this was, that test wasn't satisfied. They, they well, otherwise, <laughs> it was just a question of fact for them. And they, they did their best on the very scanty evidence. They asked the themselves the wrong question, and as did the FTT. Both of them, we say, um, uh, failed to recognise that these arrangements, uh, the payments that were made here, were made as part of arrangements, the only purpose of which, objectively discernible purpose of which, seems to be to provide a private benefit, that is the tax saving, to their employees. The question then is, in the opinion of the young, is that just an effect or is that an integral part of the purpose such that it must have, I cannot but, have been a purpose for which these arrangements were entered into? And we say that the answer to that looks at the facts here and the various indicators, not least the fact that um, Hamilton Trust said it was not <coughs> even aiming to earn profit, the fact that there are in fact um, uh, findings from the FTT that totally everything was paid out because um, at, at paragraph 169, there, uh, it talks, about, let me take you to that now, where are we in, in terms of timing? Perhaps, it, perhaps if I might pick this up after the, short, uh, after the lunch journal. Um, because I think this is a point that's worth, worth certainly going through. Can I ask something I'd just like to have clarified as well? My understanding is that the transfers here are the payment by the um, end user. No, my lord, the transfer of assets here is the entry into the employment contract because the transfer is the creation of rights, section 716 sub 2. The creation of rights is uh, under the employment contract is the transfer. And the rights are themselves assets. Assets are defined in section 714. And it's IRC, in, uh, sorry, uh, assets are defined in 715. Uh, uh, five, and includes property of any kind. So shows as an action, rights, etc. Yes. are assets. So the entry into the employment contract, IRC in bracket, I think it's common ground that that is a transfer of assets for these purposes. It's not, it, there are many things are capable of being transfers of assets. There could, in fact, uh, well, the, the transfer of assets here, we say, is the entry into the employment contract, as a result of which the fee income is generated, which is received by the person abroad. How is entering into an, an employment contract a transfer of assets? Uh, 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 well, apart from the fact that it's the creation of rights, uh, and that is, how, that is defined as a transfer for 716 sub 2 purposes. And that's already a bit of a signal. It's a pretty unusual set of circumstances, isn't it? Well, as Lord, uh, well, one has to have regard to the term being defined as well as the definition, and I quite see how you get within, you sort of scrape within the definition, but it's anything but the paradigm case of somebody in the UK who transfers assets in the ordinarily understood well, sense of that word abroad in order to uh, avoid tax. I mean, my Lord, it isn't just I who say this all the people behind me. I'll see in bracket Crossland and Hawkins, um, uh, which case is it? The Haley Mills case. Um, they all concern yeah. uh, employment rights given to personal service companies where they received, uh, where the offshore company received the funds, which were then paid to them as and when they wanted. They weren't paid as loans necessarily, but they were paid as and when they wanted. Yep. So there was a cash box entity. All of those cases engaged the transfer of assets provision because of the employment contract okay. entered into by the personal service well, company. So we're not scraping at, in, do we we're actually this? relying on quite sound authority here. Have I'm we sure. got all of those cases? Have we got those cases? Uh, well, they were excluded from the bundle on the basis that they weren't, uh, please bracket, was excluded from the bundle on the basis that it wasn't uh, a matter in dispute. We're very happy to provide it. Uh, 
Um, and I think it would be useful. Absolutely. Very well. Thank you very much. Uh, two o'clock.